Genius Warlock Genius 1. The 19th century was called the age of magic and industry. Humanity has developed by leaps and bounds. The forests were cleared, railroads were laid, airships were in the sky, and cars were circulating in the streets. Did it end here? And oh. The economy developed, the population exploded, and numerous colonies were established. Some said, this was the golden age of mankind, and yet some places were alienated. This was the case with the mining town right here. This is a village, which doesn't even have a proper name. It is a place where minerals come out, and it was a place where people at the bottom of the social pyramid gathered, and of course, at the bottom of them were the children. Most of the children here were orphans who had similar backgrounds. They didn't know who their father and mother were, and they were raised until the age of 14 by the government subsidies, after which they were sold to the mining village here in the name of employment and independence. It was illegal, but no one cared. Because this was very common here. Perhaps because of that, the appearance of the children all looked alike. A face that has turned black from mining, lifeless eyes, and a skinny body. It may be too much to say, but they were more like cogs or screws in human form rather than human beings. It's as if they were squeezed to the limit and were broken to the point, if they were to be squeezed a bit more then they'll get sick and die. Like the saying nature provides an exception to every rule, even in this place there was a strange child. This child's name was Oliver. There was nothing special about him but still he was a little bizarre. No, it was more than that. Oliver, who was smaller and thinner than the other children, had pale skin. He was reminiscent of a living corpse, and he was an ugly child that no one would think of as strange if he died right away tomorrow. However, that was ironically the proof that Oliver was bizarre. It was three years and four months from now when Oliver got sold to this mine, at that time he was hated by the manager, so he couldn't get to eat properly, so he was much more miserable than he is now. Seeing such a soggy child, all of them expected that he would die in less than three months, some even started betting on when he would die. In fact, Oliver fell ill, less than a week after his arrival to the mine. His condition was so serious that he couldn't even breathe properly and his body boiled like a kettle. But to everyone's surprise, Oliver miraculously recovered when they were preparing to dig a place to bury him. Rather, the other children, who were fine until the day before, suddenly fell ill and died. And that wasn't the end. Oliver had many other oddities that cannot be properly explained. It was difficult to avoid the angry supervisor but Oliver was strangely quick to notice the change and was able to avoid being the supervisor's target. Even if he was the target of harassment by bullying, he luckily escapes quickly, with the perpetrator dying of illness. In addition, the fierce guard dog watching over the children was especially scared in front of Oliver, and the rats disappeared one by one in the places wherever Oliver worked or slept. These strange phenomena overlapped, and resulted in Oliver being alienated, and treated as an ominous object by everyone. But Oliver, the concerned party, did not care about these at all. His interest wasn't to be friends with anyone or to be loved by anyone. Currently, Oliver only wanted to survive as long as he could in this mine. There was no clear purpose. It was just an obsession with life. He was similar to ants and mites who were all struggling to live. Oliver was raised in an orphanage and then was raised in a mine, had nothing other than survival in his mind. However, his survival was greeted with a change one day due to a sudden visitor. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. Puang 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 puang. At the time of work, there was the sound of an alarm that shouldn't have sounded. The children, who worked in the stuffy coal mine without a trace of sunlight, looked up with difficulty, and only Oliver, who was mining in the corner, was working without paying any attention. After a while, a fat man came down on the rusty ladder. It was the supervisor who supervised the children. Attention! Attention, everyone! Gather outside right now! 
a black-faced child asked with a frightened look. Oh, supervisor? What's going on? A visitor came in after a long time. They say he's looking for a sincere hard worker, so come out and greet him. Hurry, hurry, move. Come on. At the supervisor's word a faint smile flashed across the faces of the children who had a dead expression. Why? It's because if they got chosen, they could get out of this hell. It was a kind of irregular event. This was their only hope in this hopeless mine. The children stopped what they were doing and climbed up to the ground on a rusty ladder. Tang Tang. The sound of the ladder rang, and there was a small commotion as everyone pushed each other in order to climb up first. Only Oliver got away from the commotion as he was watching them from below. He felt that there was no particular reason to rush like others. Whether it is his emotions that are dead or his soul that is broken, Oliver has never felt any emotions such as joy, expectation, or hope ever since he was born. That's why he was so calm, and he did know, maybe it was thanks to this that he still survived. Because for him, false hope was poison. The strong children were the first to climb above the ladder, and the rest of the weak children climbed the ladder following them. And of course, it was Oliver who came in last, so he got the worst seat in the last corner. Oh, it's dazzling. I think I'm going to live a little longer. Cough cough. Children who saw the sun after a long time chattered with excitement. Even the sunlight was a luxury in the coal mine. Meanwhile, a muscular man appeared in front of the children. He was the tyrant who was in charge of the mines in these fields. He had a cigarette in his mouth and was accompanied by his fierce guard dog, and he spoke in an arrogant manner. Shut up, everybody, be quiet. Don't make a fuss in front of the customer. The dog barked furiously. The children were frightened and united among themselves, only Oliver stood calmly. Then a man appeared quietly. Attention, everyone! This is the customer who came to visit us today. He needs sincere and talented workers. So everyone, be silent. The children closed their mouths as if they had made a promise not to open them and rolled their eyes to look at the man called the customer. The man was middle-aged, with a benevolent expression and a well-groomed mustache, and he seemed quite rich in his neat coat and heavy hat. This could be a good sign, a nice-looking, wealthy man who could take them anywhere better than here. But he looked a little different in Oliver's eyes. The supervisor spoke to the customer. Do you want me to recommend some children? The workers who usually behaved nicely to the supervisor smiled faintly. But the customer shook his head. No, I would like to pick one by myself. The customer then pulled something out of his coat. Surprisingly, it was chocolate. Chocolate. The children, who had been watching only chocolate wrappers all their lives, were excited. What is this? The customer spoke first. All the children tilted their heads. What is that? Does he think we don't even know what chocolate is because we work in the mines? I wondered what his intention was to ask such a question. Meanwhile, the boy who was a little faster raised his hand and said, It's chocolate. The child smiled slyly at the same time he gave the answer. He was sure to himself that this was a test to find an enterprising child who acts first, but his prediction went awry. Does anyone have any other opinions? The child who answered first the cold customer's question looked disappointed. But there was no sympathy from anyone. Rather, they raised their hand like animals, in order to not miss this opportunity. Me. I know. Me. Me. I'll answer. Sir. Please me. Children shouted and raised their hands like a flock of pigeons gathering around the crumbs, except Oliver. Oliver instead of raising his hands, fell into deep thought. Is that really chocolate? Oliver looked at the customer's hand that was holding the chocolate. Obviously, he had the chocolate in his hand, but there was something more noticeable than that. It was a black light. It was a round black light that was formed at his fingertips. 
the customer was drawing black light from his body towards the fingertips and making a circle. This was quite a shock to Oliver. Each person had a black light in their bodies, but he has never seen any of them handle it like this before. So while Oliver was shocked by the new discovery, the other children answered the questions, being pointed out by the customer. Okay, you answer. Yes. That's an opportunity. Wrong. The customer pointed to the other child. It's the future. A future where I can live a better life. Wrong. The guest pointed to another child again. It is a hope. Wrong. The customer pointed towards another child again. Then he pointed to another child. Each and every child he pointed out gave a novel answer, but nothing satisfied the customer. Before they knew it, all the hands were down, and the children whose hopes were trampled were only crying. They even shed tears because they felt it was so unfair, but fair or not, the customer only murmured in disappointment. Um, is there no one here either? It was at this moment that someone quietly raised his hand. Everyone's eyes focused on him. Ha! Huh. Ah, uh, yeah. What does this look like to you? An unexpected question. Oliver, who was least visible, replied. A circle. Ha! Huh. What? A circle. Sir. A circle? Not a square? Yes. How did you do that, sir? The customer smiled in silence. Fast forward button, 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 fast forward button. The deal was done quickly. The customer handed over a lump of money that seemed heavy to the person in charge of the site, and the person in charge of the site handed Oliver over to the customer, skipping even the questions he had to ask as a guardian. All the children went back to the mine with a look of injustice, and Oliver followed the guest, no, the new master, and left the mine. Ordinary children would have greeted him as politely and servilely as possible in order to make a good impression at this time, but Oliver did not do that, rather, he asked a bold question. Excuse me. Master? How did you do that? What? This. Is this how you do it? With those words, Oliver raised his finger. It was invincible to ordinary people but was visible to the customer. A lump of black light formed at the tip of Oliver's finger. Oliver imitated the customer's tricks just by looking at them once. It wasn't that hard either. The corners of the customer's mouth slowly lifted. Since when were you able to do that? Just now. I've seen it since I was a kid. Oliver replied, and the customer suddenly stopped and looked at Oliver. My name is Joseph. A great warlock, I will be your teacher. From now on, serve me. Genius too were were. A black mass that resembled clay and smoke revolved above Oliver's fingertips. At first, he could only make it into a round mass of light, but in less than half a day, he could transform it into triangles, squares, stars, donuts, and even human shapes. Above all, Oliver didn't get tired of it. He began to make the mass of black light change into more complex and sophisticated forms. The black smoke transformed into cones, mobius strips, and spider webs. Oliver was like a child who received a toy for the first time. Is it fun? Joseph, who was walking ahead of Oliver, suddenly asked. Yes, it can change into something like this. It's amazing. Oliver replied with pure admiration. Oliver looked gloomy because of his ugly impression and subdued voice, but the happiness on his face was sincere. Oliver didn't expect that the black light could be used like this. It was an amazing finding for Oliver. Is this black light called? Black magic? It's not a black light, it's called emotions. Emotions? Yeah, anger, sadness, hatred. Dealing with these kinds of emotions is the fundamentals of black magic. It might not seem like a big deal, but it's a very powerful force. 
Emotions are a kind of energy that comes from the soul. It can be said that it is the same principle as the magic that comes out of magic stones. By the way, you are good at handling these emotions, but your emotions are not that strong. What? Just as you heard. Your feelings are very small and humble. But. This kind of thing doesn't matter. Since you can use other people's emotions. That's the norm. At those words, Oliver's dynamic eyes lit up, like a corpse that had come back to life. It's not difficult. It's similar to how you can see others' emotions and deal with them now. Anyone can do it if they have enough talent. Think of it as similar to using your sixth sense, and invisible muscles that go beyond the ordinary senses. Oliver frowned at the complex words, but he instinctively realized one thing, that he had enough talent. Although there was no basis for it, he could be sure. At that moment, Oliver's hard brain creaked. He started to fall into his own imagination. Imagining himself handling a huge light rather than a small light like this. His cold heart started to warm up little by little when he thought of it. Oliver asked quietly, with eyes filled with desire. Can you teach me more? Black magic. Seeing his quiet but greedy eyes, Joseph pondered for a moment before answering. That's. I'll tell you more after we get home. The words teach me now came up to the end of Oliver's throat. It was a natural reaction because it was something that interested him for the first time in his life. However, as soon as he saw Joseph, he swallowed his words and decided to be patient. The reason for doing that was, the light emanating from Joseph's body. Oliver has always been able to see light around other people's body. A light that flickers when someone is angry, a light that waves when someone is sad and a light that trembles when someone is afraid. Oliver used the light to understand people's moods and used it to avoid getting caught in situations. Similarly, right now with the help of the light, he realized that if he doesn't listen to Joseph now, he won't get what he wants. He understood that Joseph wanted him to obey his orders. Noticing this, Oliver decided to use the tricks that had helped him to survive, to help him get what he wants. He pretended to be an obedient livestock, like the one Joseph wanted. Joseph smiled a little and walked along the road as if he liked the attitude of Oliver. Oliver became a good boy and followed Joseph quietly. However, even at that moment, Oliver did not shake away his thoughts about black magic, no, he carved for it more. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. A considerable amount of time has passed since the last conversation. Joseph and Oliver did not speak a word. They just walked silently. For young people, walking on the road for a long time without getting in a car or train was an arduous task, but Oliver didn't really care. He wasn't bored since he was playing with the light from his emotions while walking. All he did was use his emotions to make more complex shapes at a much faster time while moving them from left to right. Oliver thought of things that could be done with his newfound toy. He thought of the possibility of changing it to adapt for a specific use, rather than simply making a shape. He thought of mine's pickaxe, the kitchen's cleaver. But Oliver didn't limit his imaginations to just that. He thought, perhaps it could be recreated into something newer through processing rather than some known shapes. Oliver didn't learn it from anyone, but his instincts told him that it was possible. Thus Oliver unwittingly developed his own understanding and imagination of black magic, like a flower bud that was about to unfold. At that moment Joseph's voice was heard. Good. How about the inn over there? Oliver, who had buried himself in his imaginary laboratory, suddenly regained his consciousness and returned to reality. He looked up at the sky and found that night had already come, and the sky was covered with dark curtains, while the streets and surrounding forests were filled with darkness. The only light that could be seen was from a lonely inn in the distance. Joseph turned to Oliver and said, Well, we are lucky to stumble upon an inn in such a remote place. Without hesitation, Joseph approached the inn. 
the distant yellow light calmed their hearts as they approached it. As they opened the door and entered, they were greeted with a warm welcome along with the fragrant smell of food. Oh welcome, sir. The innkeeper greeted Oliver and Joseph as if he was waiting for them. A large middle-aged man rubbed his hands with a flattering smile typical of a merchant. Thank you for coming, sir. Accommodation for how many? It's me and this little boy. Do you have a room for the night? Yes, yes. Of course, we have, sir. Come, come with me. The owner politely bowed his head and led them to the room. On the way, they saw a dining hall, where there were about three to four other customers besides Joseph and Oliver. Doesn't the food look delicious? Looking at the food on the guests' tables, Joseph said. In fact, the meals the guests were eating looked quite delicious, freshly baked bread, stew, cheese, and steamed meat. It was rare for such a secluded inn to have delicious meals like steamed meat. The owner smiled and replied. Thank you for the compliment, sir. It's kind of a sales strategy. As you can see, it is a remote inn, so it is difficult to receive guests. We can only deal with the occasional passerby or truck drivers. So we are increasing the number of customers by making the food delicious. Right. It sure looks delicious. It looks like a work of a master chef. Thank you, sir. It's all my wife's work. Including the staff, this inn is run by a total of five people. Of course, you will eat, right sir? Of course, we should eat. But can we eat in the room? I want to eat quietly. I will give you more money. At that moment, the inn owner's facial muscles twitched slightly. Ah, yes, yes, of course, it is possible. Here, this is the room, sir. Please wait a moment and I will bring you the meal. Is there anything else you need? No. Okay sir, then have a nice day. The owner hurriedly went down to the first floor, while Joseph entered the room with Oliver. Joseph asked Oliver as he took off his coat. What do you think of the owner? Isn't he kind? Ah. Uh, I don't know, but he was strange. Ha ha. Isn't he? Joseph laughed. The owner did seem like a good innkeeper, but somehow his main job seemed a little different. About twenty minutes later, there was a knock on the door. A tall man who appears to be an employee brought food on a tray. I brought the food, sir. Oh! Joseph exclaimed at the delicious food such as stews and steamed meat along with freshly baked bread. Joseph handed the clerk a generous tip, and the clerk grinned. I would appreciate it if you could just put the empty bowl outside the door after you finish eating. If you need anything, please let me know sir. As the employee went outside, Oliver and Joseph looked into each other's eyes. An hour later, an empty bowl and plate were placed outside the door, and the owner, who saw it, put an evil smile on his face. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. At midnight. Thud. Thud. A dull sound rang out. It was the sound of hitting meat with a hammer, a human meat. Ha. Huh. The inn owner sighed and wiped the sweat from his forehead. No, it wasn't sweat, it was blood. At his feet lay an guest. It couldn't be seen properly because of the darkness, but the guest had been hit in the head with a hammer several times. Ah. I'm too old for this sh asterisk t. Ah, what do you mean, master? You can continue this for twenty more years. Arthur. Arthur. How old do you think I will be in twenty years? At that age, I want to live a more dignified life. By the way, is this the end? Ah, uh, no. There's the last thing in the room at the end of the hallway. The man and a child. Oh, right. Those who ate in the room. Phew. We're in luck today, shall I try harder? Won't they be awake? No, don't worry. The food has been eaten thoroughly. 
it was like they cleaned the plates by licking with their tongues. Ah, that's good. The atmosphere was weird, so I was worried about it. Yeah, the kid, in particular, he looked like a walking corpse. What are those two? He doesn't look like a rich man, did he? Well? Looking at the soot on the boy's body, he must have been a boy from a nearby coal mine. Slave traders, perverts who like children, and people who need lab rats occasionally visit those kinds of places. Wow, that's a bad thing. The innkeeper and his subordinate stood in front of the room where Joseph and Oliver were staying. The two waited for a while at the door, as usual. They made eye contact with each other and spoke softly. One. The subordinate nodded his head. Two. Once again he nodded. Three. As they were about to open the door and go inside. Bang bang bang. The door suddenly broke and something poured out. It was like a marble, and it was so fast that the subordinate got startled and sat down. When he belatedly opened his eyes, all he could see were the shards of the broken door and the owner lying down covered in shards. The owner was lying bleeding through his torso as if he had been shot. What nonsense is this? The subordinate's heart was pounding like a drum while he felt suffocating. Tack tack tack. Soon, with the sound of loud footsteps, someone walked out of the room. It was the guest who came to the inn along with a child. He looked down at the subordinate and said, 1. Genius 3 a few hours ago. Oliver and Joseph looked at each other with a table filled with delicacies between them. Do you think we should eat this food? Oliver thought for a moment and then shook his head. No. Why? That, it's a little difficult to explain. Then explain it the difficult way. Ah, uh, well, the light around the person who brought us the food was weird. Light? Yes. I mean, the emotion. When angry, it flickers, and when sad, it wavers and it trembles when afraid. So? That man. The innkeeper? Yes, the light around the innkeeper. It's faintly twisted. What if it's twisted? I don't know. I've only seen it a few times. The supervisor of the mine had that kind of a light right before he took me to the mine and when he put me into a dangerous job. You mean that kind of light is when people tell a lie? Ah, uh, yes, I think so. At Oliver's reply, Joseph nodded as if he was satisfied with his answer. Why did the innkeeper lie to us? I don't know. The reason is obvious. It's because they had a purpose. For example, this delicious food is mixed with sleeping pills. Then, after eating and sleeping, they will kill us to get our things. It wasn't a pleasant story, but Joseph seemed to be a little excited as if he was reminiscing his childhood memories. Well, then, what should we do? Ah, uh, we don't eat. That's not the right answer. If you do that then the innkeeper will realize that we've noticed. Rather, we should pretend we've been tricked and be vigilant. Remember, tricks are important to be a warlock. Oliver nodded his head with wide eyes as usual. Joseph wondered if Oliver understood what he said, but he didn't talk further. Instead, he pulled out a test tube from his chest pocket. Oliver's eyes lit up slightly when he saw the test tube. The test tube, sealed with a black stopper, contained a black liquid, as thick as tar, and it could be seen wriggling like a living creature. Is the, black thing, emotions? Oliver asked. Yeah. That's right. They are condensed emotions. How did you do it? Oliver's eyes were tinged with greed. When Joseph saw his greed, he warned him. Don't be in such a hurry. It's not something you can learn yet. Instead, I'll show you something more interesting. Think you're lucky. With those words, Joseph pulled out the stopper from the test tube, and as soon as the stopper opened, the liquid shook more violently, and Joseph placed his hand on it. When the hand is removed from the test tube, the liquid became silent, and a strand of thread was pulled out. 
Its appearance was reminiscent of a thread from a spinning machine, and as soon as the thread was pulled out, it started to change back to black light again and circled around Joseph's hand. From liquid to thread and then to light. Oliver watched the amazing and mysterious sight without saying a word. No, he was doing more than just watching. From the moment Joseph opened the lid, the world seemed to have slowed down for Oliver, he instinctively understood everything, including the principles, mechanisms, and even tricks. This was the moment when the theory that he had built in his imagination was proved to be true. Black light, emotion could be changed according to one's purpose and could be processed into something new. Come out, eater. Joseph whispered towards the black light. Hearing his whisper the black light began to sway and spun around, as it united into one, and then began to expand. This is. Oliver said while looking at the sphere in the air. It was the size of a human head, and Oliver reached out his hand towards the sphere out of curiosity before he knew it. It was similar to a child extending his hand the first time he saw fire. Just before Oliver's hand touched the sphere, one side of the sphere opened and between the crevices appeared a huge, shaggy tongue and white teeth. A gigantic mouth appeared in the air. Eater. A scavenge hunter I created. It wasn't originally intended for this, but it can be used like this too. Eat all the food. At Joseph's words, Eater began to devour the food placed on the table, licking and cleaning the plates completely, but Oliver was rather amazed at how it looked. Black magic, it is really fun. Are you curious? Yes. Well then, stay awake tonight. Maybe, you will see something even more interesting. And it was true. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. 1. Joseph said while walking out of the door, and the frightened innkeeper screaming stupidly got up and started running away. 2. Joseph didn't care and took the thread again from the test tube. When the thread turned back to light, the light condensed in an instant and turned into a bullet-like shape. All this happened in just a second or two, and Joseph while pointing his finger at the employee said. 3. Hate bullet. The ball of light flew at the chant and pierced the back of the employee. The force was so powerful that a hole the size of marble was created on his head, and the employee fell down and died even before he could scream. Oliver followed Joseph and went down with him. For safety, he should have stayed in the room, but his curiosity and lust to learn about black magic made it impossible. He wanted to watch it through to the end. He felt like it was his mission. Well, this is not surprising. Joseph saw something and murmured. Oliver looked over Joseph's shoulder from the first floor of the inn. What caught his eyes was a naked guest. No, it was a corpse of the guest and a middle-aged woman carrying that body. The fat woman innkeeper looked at Joseph and Oliver with a puzzled expression on her face. Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. Didn't you finish your dinner? I'm a little cautious so I don't eat anything suspicious. After speaking, Joseph responded like a gentleman to the woman, and he stretched out his hand. Hate bullet. The bullet of hate that flew pierced the middle-aged woman's head and chest at once. One of the waitresses, who was mopping and wiping out bloodstains next to her, was terrified and ran into the kitchen. Joseph walked leisurely and followed her, and Oliver followed Joseph, keeping a reasonable distance. It was so much fun for Oliver, who never thought black magic can use emotions like bullets. It felt like a dream come true. It was very interesting and terrifying at the same time. As Joseph was on his way to the kitchen, the employee who ran away came out. She came out with a shotgun that was usually used at the inn and pointed it at Joseph. Oliver thought at that moment. Is it possible to spread the emotion out wide and block it like a shield? As if he had known from the beginning an image was drawn in his head and to his surprise, Joseph created a curtain larger than the human height using the black light as Oliver had imagined. Die! The waitress opened fire aiming at Joseph. 
Bang bang bang. Black shield. A loud gunshot rang out. However, all the bullets from the shotgun were blocked by a wide black curtain. The bullets fired from close range were blocked so futilely, and the waitress looked at that with her eyes wide open as if she was possessed by a ghost, but that was a fatal mistake. Hate bullet. Joseph fired bullets of hatred with no mercy. With a sound, the employee with holes in her chest and stomach collapsed. Beautiful. From strange creatures to bullets and shields, everything Oliver thought and didn't think filled his eyes. Knowing how to treat customers properly is the first virtue of a waitress. Well, it's already too late for you. Joseph muttered as he approached the fallen corpse, and then muttered as if he had remembered it too late. Didn't the owner say there were five? Saying those words, Oliver turned his head to the basement without knowing it. At that moment, his eyes met with the last employee who was coming out of the basement. He was sweaty as if he had moved a heavy load. As soon as he saw the dead waitress, his face distorted and he rushed in. You be asterisk starts. He was more frightening than the supervisor of the coal mine, the butcher's knife in his hand was so sharp, as if it could cut anything with a small touch, and above all, the light emanating from his body was flickering more severely than anyone Oliver had ever seen before. Oliver was sure that he would die if he got caught. But, Oliver wasn't afraid, rather he felt the opposite, happy. Oliver stretched out his hand. It wasn't taught by anyone, but he instinctively reached out. Then he extracted the emotions of the angry employee swirling around him toward his hand. The black light moving around Oliver's hand was huge, and it was difficult to even for Oliver to explain how he did it. It was like walking for human beings, which is not taught but done instinctively. It was the realm of talent that Joseph talked about. Thump. 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 Oliver's cold heart started beating and all his nerves were focused on his hand. The inn employee was almost a few steps away. But Oliver was neither afraid nor nervous. He only cared about the emotions in his hands. Oliver painted the image in his head. Like Joseph, he condensed the fluctuating emotions fastly and more precisely. As time passed slowly the fiery emotions found stability in Oliver's hand and they took the form that he had imagined. Oliver made his hand into the shape of a gun while stretching the thumb finger and index finger. A bullet of hatred was formed at the tip of his index finger. After that, he left everything to his instincts and took aim. Hate Bullet the bullets of hatred from his fingertips flew at the chant and pierced the chest of the employee. A fist-sized hole was created with the sound of a pop, and the employee died with his eyes wide open. The silence was the only thing that filled the inn. Oliver stared intently at his hand. He recalled the feeling of using black magic for the first time, and the feeling still lingered. Soon a hand touched Oliver's head. It was Joseph. He gently stroked Oliver's head with a very admirable expression on his face. Good job. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. Oliver followed Joseph down to the basement. In the basement, there were piles of stolen items taken from the murdered guests. Expensive coats, pants, and shoes. In addition, various watches, wallets, belts, and wedding rings were packed in the box. Ha ha ha, they worked really hard. Joseph pulled a pouch out of his pocket. The yellowish leather pouch had tooth-like zippers. It was like a little creature, which was a bit unpleasant. Take everything. At Joseph's words, clumsy hands and feet sprouted from the pouch and they began to devour the stolen belongings. After confirming that the pouch was collecting the belongings, Joseph approached Oliver and spoke to him. What are you looking at? Ah, just... Why do you want to collect this? Oliver said, looking at the packed corpses and piles of blood packs. Rather than fear, there was only pure curiosity. To sell on the black market. There's nothing that can't be bought, 
and there's nothing that can't be sold. You may be able to use it in the future. Me? Yeah, warlocks inevitably use the black market. Do you want to be a warlock? Oliver nodded his head. Oliver wanted to be a warlock, it was fun and weird for Oliver. Joseph placed his hand on Oliver's head once again. It was a very friendly gesture. Why do you think I bought you? Oliver didn't answer. He heard a lot of interesting stories about how to use emotions and what black magic was, but he didn't know why Joseph bought him. It was natural because he had no interest. My goal is to train excellent warlocks. That's why I'm gathering talented kids. Me, talented? Yes. So, do you know why my goal is to train warlocks? Oliver shook his head. For their survival. If you live as a warlock, you will naturally face the world's persecutions and threats. The only way to survive is to become stronger. And I'm nurturing those talents to be strong so that they can face the world. Oliver didn't quite understand, but he just nodded his head. But nurturing talents is not easy. It's hard to find talented kids, and there's no such thing as a cleric, paladin, or mage education system. I have to bear all the effort and expenses required for education. Do you know how difficult this is? Oliver nodded mechanically and Joseph continued. And nothing is free in this world. Everything, whether it's a kind act or an evil act, all done with compensation in mind. I don't have any money. I don't need money. All I need is loyalty. Loyalty to your teacher and your master. Oliver saw the light around Joseph. The pulsing light in Joseph's body was desire. Oliver, understanding the meaning of the light, immediately bowed his head. I will obey the master. Genius for Oliver stayed awake all night. After leaving the inn, Oliver spent every night without an ounce of sleep. Even though he was tired because of the long journey, he couldn't sleep. It was not because Oliver was physically or mentally strained, rather the opposite, he was excited. During his days in the orphanage and mine, every day was just the same. He could fall asleep at any time because he was not interested in anything other than survival, but the past few days were different. Every day was exciting. He thought of it several times a day. No, dozens or hundreds of times, about the time when he extracted the emotions from the inn employee and shot him with hate bullet. The mysterious and yet familiar sensation made him feel like he was flying in the sky with wings. Recalling those memories not only made Oliver excited but also at the same time feel bad. Oliver felt that if he had concentrated a little more at that time, he could have extracted much more emotions at a much faster speed. He felt if he had restrained his joy and concentrated a little more, he could have shot several shots at the same time, not one. He regretted that he could have cast advanced black magic rather than imitating what Joseph did. Oliver reflected on each of those regrets. And he did image training in his head to relieve that disappointment. He extracts more emotions, shoots more hate bullets, and increases the speed, accuracy, and power. In time, he also gave a unique shape to the hate bullet. Even though it was just an imagination in his head, Oliver had the confidence to apply it in reality. If it had not been for the words of Joseph, his master and teacher, he would have extracted his emotions and experimented with them right away. Don't practice black magic without my permission. Why? Master? Unlike the shapes created using emotions which can't be seen by people, black magic spells could be seen. We'll be arriving at our destination soon and I don't want you to attract useless attention. Above everything, a true warlock would never use his own emotions for black magic. Emotions are limited resources, and if you use them recklessly, your soul will become empty, so unless you are really out of options, you should avoid using your emotions. Then. Can I practice if I extract it from someone? No. You should never use black magic without my permission. Did you forget what I told you at the end? You should obey and follow me without asking questions. Then I will teach you. 
Because of those words, Oliver had no choice but to practice black magic only in his head. It was frustrating, but he couldn't help it. Joseph demanded obedience, so he had to obey as much as he could in order to receive his teaching, even if it was just on the surface. Before he knew it, the dark sky turned gray and gradually turned blue. The sun rose again, and Joseph also rose up from his seat. Hmm. Sleeping in the streets isn't that bad. Huh. Did you wake up early? No, you didn't sleep, right? Joseph said, looking at Oliver with a pale complexion and increased dark circles around his eyes. As usual, Joseph went to a nearby stream to wash his face and washed his mouth with an oral cleanser. Grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Even though they were young, they looked older than Oliver, all of them were in their mid to early twenties. As soon as Joseph appeared, they stopped what they were doing, approached Joseph, and bowed their heads. I greet the master. Welcome. Master. How was the journey master? The smell of spoiled meat and sweat emanated from their body, but they tried their best to look good in front of Joseph. As if familiar with the sight, Joseph pushed Oliver's back and spoke. This is the new kid I brought. He'll be a family member from today, so teach him the rules and everything about this place. The children smiled brightly at Joseph's words. They looked happy as if they got a new brother, at least on the outside. Yes, we will do it. Master. Upon hearing the answer, Joseph calmly left Oliver behind. Oliver didn't understand what was going on, and soon he was left alone in a strange place. No, Oliver wasn't alone, there were fiercely glaring workers around. They spoke with a frown like an angry dog. What? Don't you understand what's going on? Go, get ready to work. Thus began Oliver's new life. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. Ting. 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 In the morning, there was the sound of knocking on the crushed frying pan. The children, who were sleeping on a soggy mattress, woke up one by one to the painful metal sound. If there was anyone who was still sleeping without waking up, the children who played the role of supervisors screamed at them. What are you doing piece of sh asterisk t? Don't be lazy. Get up quickly. After hearing the scream, the children woke up in a hurry because they knew if they didn't soon a kick would follow, and the first to wake among them was Oliver. A week has passed since Oliver came here, and he was quickly adjusting to life here. It was one of his unique abilities, to adapt quickly wherever he was. In the morning, he came out of the warehouse called the accommodation and cleaned the inside of the factory. After he finished cleaning, he ate the bread and soup provided. It was an old hard bread, but it was a pretty good meal compared to the watery porridge he had in the mine. After the meal, he once again started working in the factory. For Oliver, this wasn't hard because it was a job where he had to just make sausage with the meat that came in that day. The smell of spoiled meat was bad, but it wasn't a big deal for Oliver, who had a dull sense of taste or smell, and it was easy compared to the heavy work he had to do in the mine where there wouldn't be any sunlight. The workload was also jagged from day to day, but it was basically small and had nothing to complain about. Rather it was the mind not the body that was having a hard time. Obviously, Oliver expected that Joseph would teach him black magic as soon as he came to this place, but contrary to his expectations, Joseph just left after leaving Oliver here. Oliver wanted to ask what was going on, but he couldn't ask because of his experience in the orphanage and mine, and his desire to obey. Working was not a problem at all, but he wanted to know when he could learn black magic. Oliver wasn't confident about dealing with the disappointment in case he had to continue working in the factory without being able to learn black magic. It was then. Slap. A burning pain rushed into Oliver's face, as he stumbled backward. When the blurred vision became clear, there was a man standing in front of him, a ferocious young man with a masculine body. He said, thrusting his hand on Oliver's chest. This damn foo asterisk cur, didn't I ask you to move all the meat? He was the supervisor in charge of the male workers. I, mu, vet it. Oliver replied with a dull pronunciation from the pain. Dissatisfied with the look on Oliver's face, the supervisor thrust his hand on Oliver one more time. This bugger. Hey, teach him a lesson. Even though I'll be leaving this place soon. I can't stand the thought of this sucker staying in the place where I once worked. It's not like we've got a shortage of workers. At the supervisor's words, the workers around, as well as the other fellow supervisors, nodded their heads. As if he liked the atmosphere, the energetic supervisor said, grabbing Oliver by the collar. 
Hey, little sh asterisk t. I warn you if you want to stay here as a worker, get your act together. It's no use pretending to be a fool. If I catch you doing something weird, I'll put you in the grinder and make you minced meat. Did you get it? Oliver nodded his head from his experience of becoming submissive whenever someone gets angry at him. The supervisor's face got further distorted by contempt. Ha! Huh. You moron, clean up all the mess here today as punishment. Oliver nodded again. Only then did the supervisor let go of Oliver's collar. At that moment another supervisor intervened. It was a woman with pale skin and short purple hair. Hey, you can't just ditch your job on someone else. Today's workshop cleaning is you guys. Everyone's eyes were on her. The supervisor who hit Oliver crumpled his face, and the female supervisor folded her arms without losing to him. Everyone swallowed their saliva and stopped their breath, while Oliver had only one thought. Where are you going to teach me black magic? Genius 5 the male supervisor said with an arrogant tone. Why do you care? The female supervisor replied. I care because I'm the same supervisor as you. You can't have your own way. Ha! Huh. The same supervisor? Same supervisor, ha! Huh. Yes, same supervisor. The woman said without losing, but the atmosphere was terrible. Everyone looked worried as if the female supervisor had done something wrong. Oliver, who was not aware of the situation, couldn't understand what was going on. It looks like you don't have a grasp of the situation yet. Haven't you heard that I'll soon be a formal disciple? That's just a rumor. Just a rumor? I heard it from a formal disciple. If you don't believe in rumors, you can just check it with your own eyes. Soon, the male supervisor gathered black light in both hands. It was a pitifully small and unstable light compared to Joseph. Others, however, stepped back in fear, the female supervisor was the only one standing tall without flattering. It's for the master to decide who would become a formal disciple. What do you think the master will do if he gets to know that you're running wild without knowing your place? When Joseph's name came out, the heated atmosphere subsided a little. The male supervisor, who looked fierce like a bulldog, also made an uncomfortable expression but he did not withdraw his hostility toward the female supervisor. Yes, that's right, it's up to the master to decide. I wonder how you'll behave at the end of this month when I officially become a formal disciple. Hey, what are you doing? Start cleaning up. The male supervisor ordered the workers to clean up. Then the workers began to move like a dog with its tail on fire. Oliver hid his presence as usual and got out of the mess. He would have normally disappeared quietly without getting noticed by anyone, but he didn't do it today. Instead of going away, he was waiting on one side for the female supervisor who helped him earlier to pass. The female supervisor was coming his way while talking to her fellow workers. Why did you do that, Marie? I'm sure that guy deserves it. Right. It's none of our business, why did you poke your nose in it? I heard that that guy Tom is going to be a formal disciple this time. I'm pretty sure. You have a lot of grudges, Marie. Enough. Everybody be quiet. Nothing's for sure. It's just a rumor. I've been here for years, how many times do you think I've heard things like that? So stop it. Just give it a rest, huh? Marie, the female supervisor, stopped walking. The reason was because she saw Oliver waiting for her. As if seeing something bothersome, Marie sighed deeply. Then she spoke coldly to Oliver. I just helped you because I didn't like that guy's behavior. I don't need your thank you. I didn't help you because you were pretty. Don't think about anything weird and go away. It's annoying. Oliver stood still with a blank look on his face. Marie asked again, frowning. What? Is there anything else you want to say? Oliver nodded. Yes, what is a formal disciple? 
fast forward button 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 what happened at the study in the basement of the sausage factory joseph who was reading a book there asked a fairly handsome blonde man who looked like he was in his mid 20s in front of him the man's name was andrew joseph's best student and the second in command of the joseph family there was a small disturbance at the factory you know the guy you brought in the other day? He was beaten to death by Tom. Is he fine? Who are you asking? The one who got beat. Is it the boy I brought the other day? Yes, but not to the point of worrying. Marie helped him when he was about to get hit hard. Marie? That's surprising. It's none of her business. Why did she stand up for him? Isn't she the kind who can't stand unreasonable things? Plus, it might have irritated her seeing Tom acting high and mighty. You know, Tom's been an informal disciple for two years, while she's been a for six years, so she's probably nervous. Ah. I remember. The girl who's been an informal disciple for a long time. Hmm, I thought aspiration was as important as talent for black magic, but I guess not. Wait a little longer and if she doesn't show any results, downgrade her to a servant. Andrew, the formal disciple didn't bother to say anything, since it was the rule of this place, those who don't have any talent should serve those who have talent. Then, I'll get going. I'll report you if anything happens. After saying that Andrew didn't go out, he just stood still in the same place. Joseph, who saw his unusual behavior, asked. What? Are you not going out? Master. May I ask you a question? Tell me. Why do you want me to keep an eye on the kid you brought in? Didn't you put him in as an informal disciple because he wasn't very talented? Joseph said, covering the book he was reading. Why are you interested in that? Well, you've never done anything like this before, that's why. The one's master picked up as an informal disciple was taught once or twice by the master, and soon you've lost interest in them, but this time it seems different. And I'm your disciple. Andrew wanted to say I'm am your disciple, so I deserve to know, but when he saw Joseph in his eyes, he was soon discouraged and blurted the end of his words. After seeing through Andrew's mind, Joseph opened his mouth like a benevolent teacher. Why? There's nothing much to it. It's just because he's pretty interesting. Interesting? Yeah, unlike other kids, who want to learn black magic to gain strength or money, he just wants to learn black magic. Isn't he interesting? So, you mean he has some talent? Not some, he has quite a lot. Andrew's expression hardened noticeably when Joseph said that. Ha ha. Are you scared? Ugh, no. No master. Don't be so scared. That guy is just in his beginning stage, on the other hand, you've been my best student for years. So, don't worry about it, just train. Yes, master. Andrew was relieved when his teacher comforted him. As he was in a hurry to leave the study, in order to avoid showing his embarrassed face to his teacher, Joseph called Andrew. Wait. Did I say Tom will be promoted to a formal disciple? Yes, you said last time, it will be officially announced at the end of this month. What's wrong, master? Well, Joseph didn't answer. Instead, he thought hard as if he had an interesting idea. Okay, it's been a while since I've come back, so it's not bad to show them mercy once. Andrew, let the informal disciples know. We're going to have a class in two days. Class? Andrew asked back in surprise. Untalented informal disciples were also taught by Joseph, but only once every two or three months. When Joseph wasn't feeling well, they never received a class once in six months, so it was an unusual case to take a class soon after his return from the trip. Andrew asked, enduring the shock. Really, are you fine with this, Master? It's okay. I'm going to promote one at the end of this month, so it's not bad to check everyone's skills one last time. 
fast reverse button 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 so we're just disciples not real disciples if you want to be a real disciple you have to at least enter the low level of formal disciples do you understand oliver nodded to marie's question at first it was hard to understand but Marie's detailed explanation gave him a rough idea of what an informal disciple was and what a formal disciple was. To put it simply, an informal disciple is only a disciple in name, but in reality, they were not a disciple. Rather, they were a disciple candidate and a worker at the same time. They were not taught anything properly and had to take care of the chores, which came as quite a shock to Oliver. Working was not a problem. The real problem was that he couldn't learn black magic properly. That's the only thing Oliver was looking forward to. It was quite a big deal for Oliver. When Marie saw that, she said. Don't be so disappointed. Life is supposed to be unfair. Whether it was because of Marie's consolation, Oliver soon regained his spirits. On the surface, his face wasn't much different from when he was disappointed because of his corpse-like appearance. Then, how do I become a formal disciple? The guy named Tom said he was about to become a formal disciple. Marie frowned when the story of Tom came out. Combined with her fiery-looking eyes and her purple hair, she looked angrier, but she spoke in a rather hysterical voice. Well, to be recognized as qualified to become at least low level of the formal disciple, you have to accumulate skills in the classes that's taken once every few months, don't expect too much. It's not easy for an informal disciple to become a formal disciple, and the number of seats is limited, so it will take several years. It's not something, you, who has been here for only a week should be thinking about. What should I do to be recognized as qualified for becoming a formal disciple? Marie frowned. Didn't you hear me? Don't think about it. Ah, you have to know how to use the basics of black magic. Do you know Hate Bullet? Have you heard of Black Shield? It's energy extracted from the soul, and it can take forms like a gun, a shield. It's way more powerful than guns. I happened to see it when the master picked me up. In an instant, he swept away the gangsters who had dominated my neighborhood. Marie made a complicated expression. Oliver could see her emotions mixed with admiration, greed, and nervousness, remembering that time. She too, coveted black magic, but for some reason, she couldn't do it properly and she has become impatient. Marie pondered for a while, but soon came to her senses and jumped out of the seat. Ah! Why am I explaining this to you? You're not my guy, and you didn't even bring anything. Ugh, what's your name? Oliver. I don't know what you were thinking about when asking me these questions, but this is the last time. I'm not free enough to answer your questions one by one. I'm giving you advice because you don't seem to know anything. If you want to get help from now on, at least bring something. There's no such thing as free in this world, okay? Oliver nodded his head. Marie didn't know whether Oliver understood it properly because he always had the same expression on his face, but Marie woke up saying it was no longer her business. Why the hell did I answer his question? Maybe I was possessed by that blank expression. Just as Marie was about to go back, a worker under Marie's supervision came running. Marie. Marie. I have good news. Good news. Oliver who stood next to Marie didn't care what she was so excited about and just stood there to listen to what she had got to say. What is it? Calm down and tell me. Surprise. Master will take a break from his work tomorrow and will be conducting a class. Can you believe it? Class? Normally, when he comes back from a trip, it usually takes four months to have the next class, right? Right. Why is this sudden change? Marie said, with a surprised look on her face. There has never been a case like this in the six years of her stay in this place. When Marie was in deep thoughts, Oliver cut in tactlessly. Do we have class tomorrow? Yes. 
That's a relief. You're really lucky. Genius 6. The next morning was different from usual. Even if the supervisor didn't beat up the frying pan, everyone got up from bed. Not simply because there was no work. Wow. It has never happened before. I can't believe there is a class. That's right, what's going on? Did something good happen? Come to think of it, I heard that the master took a huge chunk of stolen goods on the way here. Hey, do you know anything? The kids who chatted amongst themselves looked at Oliver who woke up from the worst corner and asked. This is the guy that master picked up this time. He doesn't answer anything you ask, and just stares blankly. One child said. Don't mind him. If Tom sees you speaking to him, he might pick on you. Ah, that's scary. But still, I'm so jealous of Tom. He came in with me, and I can't believe he is already a formal disciple. Is that true? Wasn't it just a rumor? Almost true. Well, Andrew's underlings talk about it almost openly. Seriously, Tom already knows how to use black magic, right? That's right, he's definitely going to be a formal disciple. He said he'd become a great warlock. So be careful with him. He has a bad personality, you'll get into a whole lot of trouble if you get on his bad side. And when he becomes an official formal disciple, well, it's not us who should be worried about, it's Marie. That six-year informal disciple will die next month. It's all because she went out of her way to help that idiot. Ah, what the f asterisk ck. Everyone was surprised looking at Oliver who approached them without making a sound and stood next to them with a lifeless face. Excuse me, sirs, can I ask you something? Oliver spoke respectfully. There was no particular reason. It was because the orphanage director and supervisor of the mine always forced him to speak politely. It became a kind of habit. Perhaps that's why Oliver's honorifics were more unpleasant than courtesy or consideration. What, what? Supervisor Tom. What kind of black magic does he use? Ha! Huh. What are you going to do with that? I'm just curious. I beg of you. Oliver asked, bowing his head. Then, he could see the light of the children who were talking spread widely and soaked in a sense of superiority. Well, if you go that far, I'll let you know only once, so listen carefully. Well, it's irrelevant to you, but to become a warlock, you must have two things. One, it the eye to see emotions and two, the ability to handle emotions. Saying that the boy raised his hand and gathered the black light. A surprisingly crude circle was created. Ah, this is called emotions. It took me months to do this alone. How about you guys? The other two children who were chatting together made a circle with black lights on their fingertips. It was a crumpled, clumsy circle. Oh, you've improved. Didn't I? I've been practicing from time to time. Ah, how is it? Are you scared? There are a lot of people who can't even do this. After being able to see and handle emotions, all that's left is processing the emotions. What's processing, sir? You don't know anything, huh? Casting black magic using emotion is called processing. It could be a more powerful weapon than a gun, an invincible shield, or a terrible monster. And you can make drugs, cosmetics, perfumes, Pilates, and a lot of money. When the word money was mentioned, the children stopped talking and exclaimed. Oliver, who was not interested, tried to ask again what he should do to become a formal disciple, but at that time someone kicked the door and shouted. You idiots! If you wake up, you should clean up and eat. What are you all doing, especially when our master is sparing his precious time and giving us lessons? Do you want to be smacked? All the workers who were listening to the supervisor's orders were stunned and stopped talking and began to move. Oliver, who could not hear the answer he wanted, was disappointed, but soon began to move from the supervisor's gaze. The supervisor grabbed Oliver and said, Hey, you! 
Don't get cocky just because you got to attend a class as soon as you came, it's never going to happen. There are guys here for more than a year and have yet to become official disciples. So don't even dream about it. Oliver saw the emotion circling around the supervisor, it shone with anger and vigilance. Oliver answered quickly, bowing his head. Yes, sir. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. As usual, Oliver started cleaning the factory with other workers. Everyone worked hard as if they were happy to take the class, and thanks to that, everything ended earlier than usual. After the cleaning, they took the meal as usual, where in addition to bread and soup, there was one more golden yellow sausage today. Everyone ate the sausage greedily, and Oliver too ate it. It was salty and greasy. Twenty minutes later, by the time they finished eating and cleaning up, a man appeared from out of nowhere. Unlike the children working in the factory, he was well built and had a fair complexion. As soon as everyone saw him, they bowed their heads. Oh, Mr. Andrew. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Everyone bowed their heads, following Tom's lead. Oliver also bowed his head, and the man named Andrew raised his hand and said, That's enough. Don't be so stiff. Have you all finished your meal? Yes, sir. Everyone answered loudly. Upon hearing the answer, Andrew gave a nod and opened his mouth. Well, follow me. Today, the master will be teaching you in person. The children had a faint smile on their faces. Considering that they only take about five classes a year, it was a fully understandable response. The children naturally lined up, and Oliver stood at the back after a quick glance at Andrew. Everyone, follow me. Andrew entered the factory warehouse. In the warehouse, between the packaged sausage boxes and items covered with unidentified tents, there was a small door. In fact, it seemed difficult to notice because it was closer to a secret passage than to a door, but when Andrew put his hand, covered with black light, the complicated pattern shone brightly and the door opened without noise. As soon as Andrew entered the door, the children followed him. Surprisingly, it was a fairly well-packed basement inside the door, and the light bulb was lit at regular intervals, making it pleasant. The children chattered among themselves as if they were having fun, imagining being a warlock living here someday. Oh, was there really a class today? A man who met Andrew on the way asked. Judging from the atmosphere, he seemed to be in the same position as Andrew. Yes. That's surprising. When the master comes back from the trip, doesn't he always rest well for a few weeks, and only read books? Hearing the question Andrew looked at Oliver in the back. I guess there are times when he doesn't. Don't mind it. Okay. After a short conversation, Andrew started walking again. After passing through several rooms and corridors, they finally entered a room that seemed like a classroom. Unlike other places, the wall was half soil because it was not properly paved. But the room wasn't very unprepared either. Although not enough for the number of people, there were desks and chairs prepared, and there were test tubes and black magic books on the shelf, and Oliver felt his quiet heart beat again after a few weeks. Welcome. Joseph, who appeared out of nowhere, said while standing at the podium, in front of everyone. Everyone bowed their heads as soon as they saw him. We greet the master. We greet the master. Joseph raised his hand lightly and ordered them to sit down. There were ten desks, which was absurdly small for informal disciples who were over thirty to sit on, but there was no problem. When the three supervisors sat down first, the workers began to fight for the rest of the seats. Slow-footed and weak children were forced to stand in the back and hear the classes uncomfortably. Faster, stronger people can enjoy more, that was the motto and the first teaching of being a warlock. As soon as the class started, Joseph asked Andrew. Are you not going out? Can I join you in your class, Master, if you don't mind? Since Master's teaching is always useful. Do as you please. 
Andrew bowed when the permission was granted. Joseph quickly started the class. Well, this is a special class that I'll be giving you, so listen carefully. First of all, let's talk about the basics before the full-fledged class. What is black magic? Marie raised her hand before anyone. It's basically a study on using emotions. To be precise, it's actually a study that deals with the soul, which is the foundation of human beings. Emotions are just some energy from the soul. Yes, black magic is essentially the study of dealing with the soul. Therefore, in addition to emotions, invisible human characteristics such as vitality and attractiveness can be extracted and used. Since the soul is the foundation of everything, black magic can be said to be the search for truth and fundamentals of human beings. Oh! Everyone nodded in admiration and writes in their notebooks as if they understood. Oliver thought he was the only one who didn't understand. Well then, is there anyone who can tell me what is the foundation of black magic? Once again Marie raised her hand. Seeing emotions and handling them are the foundations of black magic. Yes, no matter how much knowledge you have, it's useless if you can't see and handle emotions. And what next? To become a warlock, you need to have the ability to extract the emotions and process them. That's right. That's the basics of the basics and it's the real first step. But it is also as difficult as it is. Why? Emotion is the energy of the soul. The moment you try to extract and process, it affects the warlock himself. Grief, anger, hatred. If the warlock is careless or lacks the ability, he or she can be affected by emotions and suffer damage. Yes. Black magic has the most destructive power and efficiency, but it's not without any risk. If the warlock's mental strength is weak or he lacks skills, he or she would be rather eaten by the emotion. Therefore, black magic is the strongest magic only in theory, but there was no one who was able to reach it practically. The atmosphere became solemn for a moment. Everyone felt worried and scared that black magic was not that easy. Clap. Joseph clapped his hands to draw the attention of everyone. That's why I had this class. So that at least one person can build up their skills. Let's stop with the theory and try to extract emotions. Joseph gave an experimental flask to the informal disciples. There was a moving mass of emotion in it. The first one who received it was Tom. He smiled confidently and touched the mouth of the flask. After a while, a black thread slowly came up. Everyone exclaimed and admired it. Next, it was handed to Marie. She had to try a little harder than Tom to extract the emotions. Marie frowned heavily, and Tom smirked derisively at the sight. Next, it was given to the supervisor who manages Oliver. He also extracted emotions but had a hard time compared to Marie and Tom. Supervisors sure are in a different league. Someone murmured. After all the supervisors extracted the emotions, it was the turn of the workers among the informal disciples. Everyone looked determined, but only a few were chosen from among them. There were only a handful of people who could properly extract and pull out the emotions to their hands, while for the rest, the extracted emotions got cut off midway or were not even able to pull out the emotions. In addition, it seemed difficult for those who extracted to maintain the emotions collected in their hands, it was also the reason why they were not made formal disciples. Come on, take it. Finally, it was Oliver's turn. Oliver just stared at the flask container, but the other informal disciples didn't even bother to turn their heads in Oliver's direction since they knew that they had nothing to see, until Oliver opened his mouth. Master. Everyone looked at Oliver reflexively. What is it? How much do I have to extract? Everyone's eyes grew wider except for Joseph. As much as you can extract. It's training. So, extract and handle as much emotion as possible. As soon as Joseph finished his words, Oliver placed his hand on the mouth of the flask. Then, 
he began to extract emotions based on the image training he had been doing. The lump of emotion, which occupied about one-third of the container fluctuated, and soared out of the flask container. Surprisingly, it regained stability in Oliver's hands. What should I do next, Master? Oliver's question echoed in the room filled with silence. Genius 7. Everyone was shocked. It's said that it's much easier to extract the emotions stored in the flask than to extract them directly from a person, but to extract that much at once, no one had words to express their shock. It was hard to even for low-level formal disciples, and not an easy task for intermediate formal disciples. Above all, Oliver didn't even break a sweat doing it. The higher the quality of the emotion, the higher the volume, and the higher the burden that the warlock should feel, but Oliver showed no signs of it. Rather, he looked like a child playing with a toy. U, G, H. Ugh. Ah. While everyone was surprised and dumbstruck, Oliver felt something strange and asked in his peculiar dull manner. Did I do something wrong? No, it's great. Right? Joseph asked Andrew, who was watching from the back, and Andrew nodded slowly. Yeah, yes, that's pretty good. Really? The chaotic atmosphere regained stability, and Joseph continued his lesson. Now, what you just did is extraction. It's the first step in black magic. There are a total of two ways to extract emotions. Anyone? Marie raised her hand again. She seemed very agitated. Ah, the first is to extract emotions stored in the test tube, and the second is to extract emotions directly from people. What are the similarities and differences between the two? The common thing is that they both are emotions from real people. The difference is that one is pre-picked and stored, while the other one is extracted on site. What's harder? The second one is harder. Pre-picked emotions are easy to extract, but when emotions are extracted on site, there are chances where the target might resist, if you try to extract during combat, it might become fatal. Joseph nodded and praised Marie with a satisfactory response. But for Oliver, it was a bit of a mystery. Although he had only one experience, it didn't feel like it was very difficult to extract emotions directly from people. No, it was rather fun, at least for him. Joseph opened his mouth again. As Marie said, it's harder to extract emotions from people. Even ordinary people resist instinctively. If you do it wrong, you may fail to extract it or you may get hit. So warlocks always store a certain amount of emotion. However, a true warlock should not rely solely on pre-picked emotions. This is because skills are also skills and emotions extracted from people are of better quality. Do you understand? Yes, master. So, don't be satisfied with your current level and do your best to be more proficient, and those who fail should train more and more. Remember, time will never wait for you. Then the children who failed to extract emotions bowed their heads. Inside their head, there were signs of nervousness, fear, jealousy, and resentment. Well, let's get back to class. All the children who were able to extract emotions, follow me. Joseph gathered the black light in his fingertips and made a circle as he did when he first met Oliver. It wasn't that long, but it was no longer fascinating for Oliver. Soon everyone started gathering and tried to imitate the shape that Joseph showed. Ugh. Ah. Whoa. Most of the imitations were more like a dented thing rather than a circle. It was only the supervisors like Tom and Marie who made the circle properly. And there was one more. It was Oliver. Oliver compressed the extracted black light into a circle the same size as Joseph. A perfect circle with little sway and no dents. Joseph manipulated the black light again and changed the circle into a square. Tom and Marie changed it relatively easily, but others couldn't change it easily and the shape collapsed in the middle. Joseph changed the square into a triangle. After the triangle, it was changed to a cone, a star, a donut, and a Mobius band, 
and at this point, only the three supervisors and Oliver were able to follow. All right, you followed me well. This is the last. Make the most difficult model you can make. The bigger, the more complex, the better. It was time to show off their individual abilities. Everyone bit their teeth tightly because they wanted to leave a good impression here. The first one to show off was Tom, who will soon be becoming a formal disciple. He created the most difficult model he could present to solidify his position. After making the black light into a cylindrical shape, it was drawn long and twisted like a spring to make it a twisted column. Everyone admired it as they looked at it. Marie next to him was conscious of him, so she tried to imitate the same shape, but she couldn't maintain the shape in the middle and it collapsed. Ah! Marie's wistful exclamation and Tom's smirking laugh were heard. Don't you want to do it? Joseph asked, looking at Oliver standing quietly in the back. Oliver looked at Joseph and asked as if he had made a decision after some thought. Can I make it as big and as sophisticated as possible? Yes. Hearing Joseph's short reply, Oliver wrapped his hands with black light, which was different from others. Everyone was curious about what he was doing, but on the inside, they thought Oliver would fail. No, they were hoping for Oliver to fail. The black light in Oliver's hands fluctuated. It was like an egg on the verge of hatching, and then it became a perfect sphere, firmly stabilizing again. It's just a ball? It was then. The black light, which regained stability, quickly shrank and became as small as beads, and soon expanded again to cover the whole classroom. Everyone was stunned because they couldn't grasp the situation, but along with him, an unbelievable scene unfolded in front of them. A black ivy vine structure covered the entire classroom. It was so elaborate as if it was a real ivy vine, and no one could open their mouth while looking at it. Everyone just looked at Oliver with their eyes open wide. Oliver looked around at the ivy vine and said softly, Oh, it works. Fast forward button, 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 fast forward button. The next morning, Oliver felt something changed. Not only the fellow workers who despised and ignored him until yesterday, but even the supervisor was somewhat cautious. On the outside, they pretended not to show it, but the light from their bodies told the truth. They were afraid and jealous of Oliver at the same time, and a few had an admiring glow. Oliver didn't understand the change. At some point in the orphanage and mine, the way people treated him had changed, but this was the first time it had changed in such a short period of time, so Oliver had no clue of why this was happening. However, his worries prevailed only for a while, soon he stopped thinking about it and started his daily routine, cleaning the factory, and began his daily life as usual. Making friends or feeling superior to them was never an option. Now Oliver's only interest was learning black magic. Perhaps because of the day off due to the class, the piled up meat was more than twice the usual amount. Oliver carried the lump of meat and brought it near the grinder. The meat was large and heavy, and most of them smelled bad, but the work was comfortable for Oliver compared to the work he did at the mine. Above all, he liked it because it was simple labor, where there was no need for him to use his head, so he could work mechanically and think about other things. For example, reflecting on the class he learned yesterday. At the same time as Oliver kept reflecting on yesterday's lessons, he kept asking questions and finding breakthroughs. For example, why is it more difficult to extract emotions directly from a person? What is the most efficient way to store emotions? Why are they putting it in a test tube? Like a three-year-old child, he constantly asked himself why and searched for answers on his own. There were times when he stumbled upon the satisfactory answers and sometimes he couldn't, but the latter was the most, so he felt frustrated and uncomfortable because he couldn't scratch the surface of the answer. He wanted to hold on to someone and ask questions. Excuse me. Aren't you tired? Can I help you if you don't mind? Oliver looked up at the sudden voice. There was a worker there. 
he repeated his words thinking Oliver didn't listen to his words. It must be hard to move the meat alone, can I help you? Why? Oliver asked the worker. Oliver was not being sarcastic, he was just curious. Oh. Because it's hard to do it alone? It's less tiring if we do it together and... We're colleagues. Yes. Colleagues. Oliver knew he wasn't very smart, but he noticed something didn't make sense. Suddenly, he questioned whether the worker was a person who would help because he was his colleague. Above all, he was worried about the light circling around the worker. He was smiling, but the light around him was twisted and sly like a snake. It was a shape he had seen more than once before. Yes, it was the light emitted by the director of the orphanage, the mining supervisor, and the in-owner. But he didn't understand what the worker was trying to achieve by showing such an attitude toward him. Is that him? Yes, that's him. It's only been a week, but in yesterday's class. Really? Oliver turned his head and saw Andrew at a distance, from whom he felt a mosquito-like annoyance, alertness, and hostile light. There were people he saw for the first time, standing at a distance looking at Oliver while emitting a wary light. Oliver felt like a stray dog that's invaded the territory of another stray dog. He just wanted to learn black magic by doing the quiet work, but all of a sudden troublesome people suddenly started swirling around him. Then, a person came into Oliver's view. It was Marie. Oliver approached her just in case thinking she might help, but she frowned looking at the approaching Oliver. It wasn't just her facial expression. Many negative emotions such as anger, jealousy, and anxiety could be seen in the light around her, and Oliver had no choice but to stop approaching her without realizing it when he saw the light. He didn't know how to respond to the sudden change, and at that moment Andrew called Oliver. Oliver? Yes? Master is calling. Follow me. Fast forward button, 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 fast forward button. Oliver followed Andrew to the master's room. Like the classroom, it was in the basement of the factory, and the splendor of the room can't be compared with the classroom. A neatly finished walls and ceilings, huge beds, the smell of tangerines floating in the air, furniture he has never seen before. Yes, it was similar to the luxurious office of the director of the mine that Oliver happened to see once. Fortunately, Oliver was not very interested in this, so he did not show any interest. The only thing that interested him was Joseph had called him. I greet the master. Oliver greeted Joseph with a sense of recognition. Joseph answered, pouring whiskey into a fancy crystal glass. Yes, come on in. How are you? Oliver tilted his head at the strange question. He didn't understand what the words meant. Ah, uh, yes. I'm good. Good? Really? Yeah. However, I would like to take classes more often. Joseph, who frowned at the words, burst into laughter. Following Joseph, Andrew burst into laughter. Yeah, well, that's more like you. Is there anything else? Is there anything uncomfortable with people around you, like eating or sleeping? A lot of things came to Oliver's mind. A fellow worker who used to pick fights with him, the same bread and soup every day, and a damp, moldy mattress. No, I don't. Thank you very much for your kindness, Master. He mimicked the children's words that they used while flattering the supervisors. Everyone liked it even though they knew it was a lie, but fortunately, Joseph also seemed to like it. It's a good attitude, no, I don't know if it's a good attitude, but I like it. Excellent. A good boy needs to be given a prize, right? I have good news for you. Will you teach me black magic again, master? No, I'll give you a chance instead. A chance to become a formal disciple. Genius 8-inch what? What does that mean? A bewildered voice was heard from a place behind the sausage factory. It was a place that people rarely visit, so garbage and junk were piled up everywhere, and rats wandered around. 
Right now, two men stood in that place. One was as rugged as a backstreet thug, and the other was a blonde with a handsome face. It was Tom and Andrew. Calm down. Andrew said in an effort to calm Tom down. However, Tom didn't seem to have any intention of doing that. He was in a panic. How can I calm down? A match? A test to become a formal disciple? Why should I do that in the first place? It's my rightful place. Tom's eyes were tearful, which didn't go well with his rugged appearance. That's how unfair it was. Indeed, anyone normal would behave like that in a similar situation. Tom, who had secured a seat as a formal disciple and was days away from becoming a formal disciple, has to now have a battle with a boy, who came just a week ago for that seat. But Andrew's response was callous. Stop. Stop being so weak. In the first place, it's already decided. What can you do if you feel wronged? Oh, but couldn't Senior Andrew be able to say something? Did you think I didn't say anything? I said. Along with other senior students we spoke to the master and said that it doesn't make sense to give such a perk to a guy who's only been here for a week. But it didn't work. His last performance was so overwhelming that. Andrew blurted the end of his sentence, and Tom felt even more desperate. Tom was there, too. Originally, it was a place to show off his ability as the next formal disciple, but funnily, it became a stage for a guy who stayed here for less than a week. Tom was still suspicious. He couldn't believe the things that conspired in front of his eyes. As if it wasn't enough to extract a huge emotion, the new guy processed the emotion into a way bigger and a way stranger shape. Everything felt like a dream, a terrible dream. Tom said with eyes filled with tears. It's unfair. It's unfair, senior. You know how hard I tried to be a formal disciple. At that moment, Andrew pushed Tom toward the wall. Wake up. Get a hold of yourself. I told you, it's already decided. And this match is a rather good thing for you. If there was a guy with a talent like that, even if you became a formal disciple, you'd one day be pushed out. Tom's expression grew even darker. He thought of everything he did to get on the good side of Andrew. He stole the sausages from the factory, sold them in the back alley, and gave him all the money, but now instead of helping, he's getting preached, he couldn't help but feel wronged hearing it. But there was nothing Tom could do. Since this was the world of black magic. A world where power was everything. Andrew said again. Again, it was you who would have got pushed out in the first place but I persuaded the master along with the other senior disciples to decide it with a match. So you should rather thank me. Tom said nothing, but he was still filled with disappointment. Andrew opened his mouth again with satisfaction. I understand you're hurt, but I think it's an opportunity. Opportunity? Yeah, opportunity. You see, that Oliver or something. How talented do you think he is? Tom replied after thinking for a while. I think, he is great talent. Yeah, but black magic is not just about talent. If you're going to step on him, there's no better chance than right now. Think. If someone with that talent is taught in earnest, he'll someday stand above you. Can you stand a situation in which a guy who just came in, order you around? Tom shook his head firmly. Just being from the streets didn't mean that he had no pride. No, he was more obsessed with that because he was from the streets. It would be hard to hurt him now because the master is watching him now. Then, you should trample that bugger head on and proudly. Tom understood the meaning and asked cautiously. To trample proudly. Andrew handed two small glass bottles to Tom. A special glass bottle that had a strange magic line drawn on the outside, and the black light inside it was shaking vigorously. No matter how talented he is, all he could have learned right away is the basic skills, hate bullet and black shield. So, you have to use this. If you open the lid and throw it at him, it will be over. What's this? My specialty, 
loss bomb. It can completely destroy the simple black shield made by beginners. I wanted to put in stronger black magic, but I compromised as much as I could because it could raise suspicion. Tom squeezed the bottle tightly in his hand. That guy Oliver is said to be brought from a mine, and he's actually dull, so he won't be able to respond to the sudden situation. Then, you can pretend as if you made a mistake and kill him. Tom calculated. If he used the black magic Andrew gave him during the fight, the guy named Oliver would surely be confused by the tremendous firepower, and if he attacked again then, it would be possible enough to make that guy disappear. Then you'll be a regular disciple, and the troublemaker will just disappear. Our peace will be preserved. If everything goes well, I'll take responsibility for you and raise you to an intermediate disciple, no, maybe a senior disciple. Tom's eyes grew bigger hearing about the position like a nobleman attended by his servants. When it comes to senior disciples they were paid high wages, and they could learn to run a business. It was Tom's goal, his dream. Farewell to the garbage life. Tom was suddenly encouraged and motivated. Andrew smirked looking at Tom's feelings. As expected, people are easy to handle. The more stupid they are, the easy handling them will be. Andrew said again. So make sure you knock down Oliver. Then I'll definitely watch your back. Okay? Tom nodded, clutching the bottle Andrew handed him. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. The last day of the month May. Originally, this day was supposed to be the day for the appointment of the new official disciple. The nominee was Tom. It should have been a day where everyone except Tom should have looked sad. However, a small unexpected event occurred, and the day of appointing a formal student suddenly turned into a match day. The match between Tom and Oliver. The prize for the winner was the official disciple position. It was a position that was created thanks to the death of one of the low-level junior disciples due to food poisoning, and no one knew when the seat would be created. Therefore, Tom's expression was tense. Because he knew how grave the situation was. Oliver, on the other hand, had his usual blank expression. As if he didn't know how much privilege he will be getting if he win the battle. Tom looked around. There were about thirty informal disciples about twenty low-level junior disciples, about ten intermediate disciples, and five senior disciples. The senior and intermediate disciples laughed and talked leisurely, treating the match as entertainment, and what was even more annoying was the eyes of the informal disciples. Their eyes were shining cold with insidious expectations, expecting Tom's downfall. This made Tom's rage rise up. Let's see who's going to go down. Tom fiddled with the two bottles of glass that were in his pocket while thinking. He thought that if he used it properly, Oliver, the guy who came in just a week ago, would be finished in an instant. He thought maybe he might get caught in the eyes of the master and be taught more by him. If that happens, Tom thought he might become a senior disciple, and one day, he might become a true warlock and say goodbye to his life at the bottom of society. After thinking about it, Tom came up to the podium with courage and desire. Oliver came up next. Well then, we don't need useless rhetoric, do we? Prove your worth with force. Start the match. Tom, hearing the words of Joseph, extracted the emotions from the test tube he was given and shot hate bullet immediately. Since he learned the basics, Oliver managed to prevent the attack by making a small black shield. Of course. No matter how talented you are, it's hard to learn black magic in such a short time. I can win. I can win. Yes. Tom screamed inwardly, extracting emotions from the test tube again and shooting hate bullet. Although it was the basics of the basics, it was a powerful and efficient attack. Oliver seemed like giving his all to block the attack, let alone counterattacking. Tom didn't lose his momentum and continued to shoot hate bullet. Bullets of hate flooded in, and Oliver spread a small black shield every time. A black bullet that cuts through the air, a black curtain that blocks the bullet. 
At that moment a voice was heard in the head of Tom who was on the offensive. Stop. You've already used a lot of emotions. Be careful. Tom stopped at that moment. He heard Andrew's voice in his head. It was a kind of telepathy. Tom paused the attack, as Andrew advised, and examined the emotions left on the test tube. Surprisingly, as Andrew said, only one-third of the emotions were left in the test tube. Maybe it's natural because he kept attacking like that. However, what was surprising was Oliver's condition. Even though he attacked so hard, there was not even a scratch on him. Far from being hurt, there was no expression on his face, and the emotions left in the test tube were similar to what they were when they were first handed out. At that moment Tom realized. Oliver was not in a hurry to stop his attack, he just stopped it moderately. He was just playing around with him. Like a thug fighting a weak child. At that moment Tom felt a surge of anger. He felt humiliated. Tom took out a glass bottle hidden in his pocket. Then he shouted. Let's see if you can stop this and get away with it. Lost bomb. Tom threw a fist-sized black bead at Oliver. Oliver hurriedly spread the black shield in surprise, but it was meaningless. The moment the bomb of anger touched the black shield, a huge explosion erupted, and the basement shook. The people who were sitting close to Oliver fell backward, while screams and admiration poured out from here and there. Did you just see that? How did an informal disciple learn the loss bomb? How did he learn that? You have to be in the intermediate disciple level to learn it. Tom smiled. He imprinted his presence on everyone. He thought that the master now had no choice but to keep an eye on him. Ha! Look at that! You bragged about your talent, and see where you eventually. Ha! Huh. The smile on Tom's face started disappearing. It was because as the smoke gradually cleared up, he saw Oliver standing there leisurely. Wow, how did you do that? Oliver said, looking at Tom. Far from being afraid, there wasn't a hint of surprise. He was rather pleased. What? How? No way. This is Senior Andrew's spell. How can he? Thump. 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 Tom felt a strange feeling, a feeling he never felt. Yes, something must be wrong. There's no way a kid who just came in can stop this attack. Tom hurriedly pulled out the last remaining loss bomb without noticing the situation he was in. He opened the glass bottle and threw it at Oliver once again and when Oliver saw it, he shot hate bullet at that bottle, and in an instant, it exploded in the air. Once again, a huge roar swept the area. However, the difference this time was Tom also got swept away as he couldn't overcome the shock and fell backward. Ha! Huh. Ugh! Unlike his usual self, Tom groaned when he looked at Oliver standing still with a black shield. What the hell is that? What kind of monster am I fighting with? Along with fear a lot of questions popped up in his head. Why? This should be the day I get appointed as a formal disciple. Why? Why? This should be the day I will be eating a proper meal rather than the tasteless bread and soup. Why? Why? This should be the day I will be starting to learn black magic rather than working in the factory. Why? What the hell is this? Are you all right? Oliver said as he approached. All Tom could do was scream and look around. Please. Help me. But, there was no one to help, and all he could see were cold eyes sneering at him. It was the gaze that he received while wandering the streets. Anger rose inside Tom. Anger at the world, anger at the sudden appearance of a hurdle. Tom tried to fight again using this anger as the source but at that moment he heard the voice of the devil. Oh, that's a relief. You're all right. Saying that the devil reached out. And soon the devil started extracting Tom's anger. Tom opened his eyes wide, but Oliver immediately stopped paying attention to Tom and began processing the extracted anger. It's called, Lost Bomb, right? 
Tom's instinct shouted asking him to run away, but the body didn't move. What the hell is he? Oliver once again processed the lost bomb. He compressed the bomb to the size of a fist and placed it on hate bullet. He aimed at Tom in that state. Aren't you going to defend yourself? Instinctively Tom deployed the black shield, praying to God. Please, just this once, help me, save me. As he was praying, the devil opened his mouth and said. Lost bullet. The bullet of anger flew with the chant in a straight line and penetrated the black shield. The bullet penetrated through Tom without any mercy and exploded inside Tom's body along with him. Boom! Red showers started pouring down at the sound of the explosion which was incomparable to that of Tom's lost bomb. When everyone's gaze was fixed on the podium, someone's voice was heard. The winner, Oliver. Genius 9. Tiles on the floor, pipes connected to the walls, steam in the air. Oliver, who won the showdown, went to wash in the shower in the basement after being declared the winner by Joseph. Washing with warm water was quite unfamiliar as this was the first time in his life, but it wasn't too bad nonetheless. It was much easier to wash in warm water than in cold water, so just by bringing his face to the stream, the hard blood droplets easily fall off. After washing up, Oliver wiped himself with a towel and went outside. The clothes he had put in the basket were gone, and instead, there was a new set of clothes which he saw for the first time. Oliver stood still, not sure what to do thinking where the hell did his clothes go. He wanted to go out and find his clothes, but at that time he heard a voice coming from outside the door. That. Did you finish washing up? What? Did you finish washing up? This is the first time he heard this voice, but he answered. Yes. Okay then. Get dressed and come out. I'll tell you where you will live from now on. Oliver turned to the strangely trembling voice and said. There is a problem. Problem? Yes, my clothes are missing. That rag, no clothes? Yes. I threw them away. I have placed new clothes into the basket, so just change into them. Even as a low-level disciple, you have to consider our master's face and should have some dignity. Why? Is it, by any chance, an important outfit? No. No. Whoa. A sigh of relief can be heard through the door. Oliver took out the new set of clothes from the basket and put them on, as the voice said. A white shirt, jeans with suspenders, and a black jacket. It was a little bigger than Oliver's body, but there was no problem. Rather, it could be said to be a blessing. It was the best outfit Oliver had ever worn, although the party involved didn't really care much. After getting dressed, he opened the door and went out. Outside the door stood a young man who looked about five years older than Oliver. Are you done changing? Yeah. Really? Then, follow me. The strangely rigid man spoke and moved awkwardly. He seemed to be treating him as his subordinate, but he was still cautious, but when Oliver looked at his feelings, he could see that he was scared. Oliver didn't understand what was wrong with him, but he didn't care to know about it. After passing through an anthill-like hallway, they arrived at a huge dormitory. There were about ten people. The number of people was similar to when he was an informal disciple but the size and quality of the room were completely different. Although crude, there was one proper iron bed according to the number of people, and next to the bed was a cabinet table and a small desk where personal items could be stored. It was incomparable to a barn that had only a damp mattress. This is your dormitory. Oliver turned his head and stared. The young man who said those words was sweating as if his gaze was burdensome. Even intermediate disciples are not qualified to have a private room, it's only possible if you become a senior disciple. Oliver asked, Do I stay here? Do I? Ha! Huh. Ah, now that you're a junior disciple, shouldn't you stay here? Oliver tilted his head as if he didn't know because he really didn't know. 
The only reason he wanted to become a junior disciple was to learn black magic, and it didn't include any improvement in life or treatment. No, it would be more accurate to say that he didn't even think about it at all. Oliver asked again, just in case. Can I really stay here? Yeah, that's your seat. The young man pointed towards the worst place in the corner. Oliver approached and looked at it. A bed that was neither damp nor moldy, a warm-looking blanket, sturdy cabinets, a hanger, etc. Ah, if you don't like the seat. I like it. Do you like it? Yes, thank you. When Oliver expressed his gratitude, the young man breathed a sigh of relief, and then opened his mouth again with courage. Then, let me tell you about some rules. Rules. Oliver pricked up his ears. There were rules in the orphanage, there were rules in the mine, and also in the factory above. If you break the rules, you will be beaten hard and will be kicked out. Oliver felt he can finally learn black magic, so he thought it would be unfair if he got chased out. What are the rules? Ah, uh, it's not a big deal, it's about the role you have to play as a junior disciple. First of all, I'm the leader of this room. So you have to follow my instructions. Yes, sir. You don't have to. Anyway, I'll explain again. A junior disciple is considered an official disciple, but still in the lowest rank of the family. Informal disciples and servants are not formal family members. Do you understand? Oliver didn't know what a servant was or what a family was, but still, he nodded. Okay, the servants do the chores, such as preparing meals and cleaning the room but we have to clean important places. For example, the classroom, labs, workshops, study rooms, etc. Master likes clean things, so you have to clean them every morning. Did you understand? Oliver nodded again. Aside from that, it's our duty to run small errands for our seniors and to help with experiments. Experiment? Yeah, you just have to do what they tell you to do. Ah. Uh, I see. But, sir, can I ask you something? What, what is it? When will I be able to receive our master's instruction? Ah, uh, junior students are usually educated once every two weeks. In some cases, classes are conducted once a month, still, most of them are self-study based on the content of the class. Ah. Uh. A strange disappointment flashed across Oliver's corpse-like blank face. Originally he was happy to be able to attend classes regularly, but there were still so few. He thought he would be able to take a new class every day. Perhaps aware of such feelings, the room leader spoke to comfort him. Master is busy teaching seniors and managing the business, so there's nothing we can do about it. And don't work too hard. Why? Oliver asked sincerely, he had just become a junior disciple, so why he shouldn't work hard? The leader didn't answer, kept his mouth shut, and then mumbled. That's, um, no, just don't worry about it. That's all I'm going to tell you. Do you have any more questions? There is none. Okay. So, let's get along well from now on. Oh, that's right. Check the drawers and check all the stuff. Make sure there are notebooks and pencils, if you say there isn't later, they won't be given out except at regular distribution times. Oliver opened the drawer and checked, and just as the room chief said, there was an old, yellowish notebook, a pencil that looked like it had been used, and a messy eraser. Why are they here? Well, don't you have to write something to learn black magic in earnest? Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. During his personal time, Oliver left the basement and went up to the surface. Unlike when he was an informal disciple, he did not work in the factory, so he had more time to utilize than he expected, but that didn't mean he came to the ground for no reason. Oliver came out to the workshop through the sausage box and junk and visited the factory workshop where he used to clean up. 
There were a lot of crushed meat crumbs and trash on the floor, and when the informal disciples who were cleaning them found Oliver, they quickly lowered their eyes and bowed their heads. Now that Oliver is an official disciple, he was above them. Of course, it wasn't just that. When Oliver saw the sudden change in the attitude of his fellow workers, he tilted his head. They were jealous and envious of Oliver, at the same time they also had fear and anger. He saw the light similar to that of the room leader, so he couldn't really understand. Oliver approached one of the informal disciples. Can I ask you something? Ah, uh, yes? Where is Supervisor Marie? The worker said that Marie was in a corner of the factory, and when Oliver actually went to check it out, she was standing alone behind a huge, red, rusted, and used grinder. Oliver subconsciously examined her emotions. She looked very sad and depressed. Supervisor Marie? Oliver called her politely while tapping her shoulder. Marie, who was lost in her thoughts got startled, and she looked at Oliver with a surprised expression, and then she quickly furrowed her eyebrow. Oliver, sir. Yes, hello? Oliver said hello. But her frown only deepened further. She extruded unpleasantness in the form of light, and Oliver had no way of knowing why, and she was a little perplexed. She then opened her mouth again. What brings you here? I'd like to ask you a favor. Favor? Ha! Are you kidding me now? What? No. So, how can someone who became a formal disciple within ten days of entering the factory ask for a favor from me? who has been an informal disciple for six years. She meant to be sarcastic, but unfortunately, it didn't work for Oliver, who didn't understand the sarcasm and just answered honestly. If I want to learn black magic formally, I have to learn letters and numbers. But I've never learned anything like that. So, can you teach me? Marie was silent. She found it ridiculous. Oliver asked cautiously as if he had noticed something. Did I make a mistake? Mistake. No, you didn't make a mistake. What kind of mistake would an official disciple make against someone like me? Oh, that's a relief. Ugh. Relief, what? In the end, Marie exploded at Oliver's frustrating attitude. Her shout echoed throughout the factory, but Marie, who realized it late, covered her face in anguish, but Oliver remained the same. I must have done something wrong. I don't know what it is, but I'm sorry. Marie sat down on her seat with a powerless expression, it's hard to say whether she was tired or exhausted. No. I was at fault. I was born in a shrewd corner and I'm rotting here because I didn't have talent in magic. Who's at fault, it's all my fault. You didn't do anything wrong. It sounded like a resigned voice, but Oliver saw something. It was the emotions of her obsession. Yet at the same time the emotions of nervousness and fear, it was like a vortex of light, which looked a little pretty. Oliver didn't know how to react, so he stood still until she regained her composure, and after a moment Marie spoke. Do you want me to teach you how to write and calculate numbers? Yes. So, can you do it? Have you ever studied them? Yes. I studied. You have to study them too. But, why are you asking me to teach you? Most of the junior disciples you will be living with from now on know how to write. Oliver answered, looking into the air, wondering as if it was difficult to answer. That's, that's a little. What do you mean? It's hard to explain. The way they see me is like a child standing in front of the supervisor. Marie frowned again at the incomprehensible words but Oliver soon followed up with further explanations. I'm from the mines, and I was scared of the supervisor there. All the kids there were scared when they saw the supervisor, so they lied about anything to avoid getting in trouble no matter what the supervisor asked them. And, the junior disciples are also looking at me with the same light as the children in the mine look at the supervisor. It was a brief explanation, but fortunately, Marie understood the meaning. Is it normal that junior students are afraid of Oliver? 
Tom, who was soon to be a junior disciple, was killed by Oliver. But there was something even more surprising. No way. Can you read emotions? Oliver tilted his head. Maybe? What's wrong? Oh my god. That's the second stage of, mind's eye. The first stage of the, mind's eye, is looking at emotions? It's not fair. Since when did you start reading emotions? Ah, uh, from the beginning? At Oliver's blunt answer, Marie only smiled dejectedly, as if she was exhausted from being angry. She knew that the world is unfair. And she too admitted it, but today she realized it was a mistake. How could it be so unfair? She felt it was so sad and hopeless that she couldn't even cry. At that moment, Oliver asked again without noticing anything. Then, what about words and numbers? Ah. Really? Why do I have to help you? I don't even know when I'll be demoted to a servant. I don't know when I'll get another chance. Why should I spend my precious time with you? Why? Marie spoke with her emotions, not her head. After some moment, when she regained her composure, Oliver opened his mouth. Before coming here, I heard you were a servant. What is a servant? Silence filled the space for a while. Marie, who was no longer in the mood to be angry, simply answered in a weak voice. It means a slave who will take care of the handsome official disciples. It's the end of being an informal disciple. People like me who haven't been promoted for a long time, become servants, who cook and clean until they get old. Are you sad now? Of course I'm sad. Damn it. Do you think I came here to be a maid for the rest of my life? Of course not, I'm here to be a warlock. I really don't have enough time now. But you want me to use that time for you. For you who have talents, I don't have. That's. As soon as Marie finished her words, she covered her face with her hands as if she was in great pain. Her invisible lump of sorrow seemed to crush her. Perhaps, if it was left as it is, after a few days, she wouldn't have borne the weight and might have become wretched. Fortunately, nothing like that happened. Didn't Supervisor Marie say? Next time if I were to ask for help, I had to bring something. Marie tilted her head slightly. If Supervisor Marie teaches me letters and numbers, I will teach you too. What? Black magic. Genius 10. Oliver adapted himself to the life as a junior disciple without difficulty. In fact, the word adaptation was ridiculous. All he had to do was to get up early every morning and clean the classroom, laboratory, workshop, and study. It was just like when he used to be an informal disciple, and the amount of work was frankly incomparably small. After cleaning, it's breakfast. He couldn't eat to his heart's content because he ate it after the senior and intermediate formal disciples, but nevertheless, he was able to enjoy a plentiful meal that could not be compared to when he was an informal disciple because he received sausages, ham, thick soup, and freshly baked bread every day. What was rather painful was that he was suddenly freed with improved life and a plethora of personal time. Oliver asked the room leader when he would be able to attend class, just in case. That is what the master decides. Since the last class was taken a while ago, I don't think there will be any class soon. Oliver sighed and asked when the study would be available. Oliver hasn't fully learned how to write yet, but if he read it properly, he thought it would be possible to self-study with a book. However, this question also returned with a disappointing answer. It won't be available. Only the master can use the study. Anyone can't open up valuable knowledge, right? At the very least, Sir Andrew could use something? Andrew is a disciple who carries out Joseph's orders. Oliver was about to ask what he had to do to become a senior disciple, but he gave up. Maybe it's because of one of the instincts that helped him survive at the orphanage and the mine? This question seemed to endanger him. As such, Oliver had a dull and boring day and he went to see Marie in his spare time to learn letters and numbers. Even though he didn't know if he'll ever need it. 
Oh, that's fast. What? Marie spoke, and Oliver questioned. She spoke again in a tone of admiration. It's about the speed of learning. You started learning the alphabet a while ago, and now you know how to use not only words but also sentences correctly. It's amazing. She praised Oliver sincerely, but he was not particularly pleased. Learning the letters was not his goal. Letters are just a road that leads to learning black magic. Can a person be happy if they reach the road and can't reach the destination? Oliver felt the same when he heard that he can't use the study freely. Obviously, Joseph's goal was to train a good warlock, but something didn't make sense. Marie, who noticed Oliver's condition, asked. Are you okay? You look weak? That's. I became a junior disciple, but I couldn't attend classes or use the study room. Oliver said without thinking. It was too much to say to Marie, who was in danger of not being able to become a lower-level disciple. Even so, as if Marie had gotten used to it now, she just accepted it bluntly. Absolutely. The study is like a treasure trove of black magic wisdom. You can't let a lower-class disciple use it, right? Why? At Oliver's question, Marie was speechless for a moment, thinking about how to explain it in an easy way. Ah. It's to make a difference. Difference. Yes, making a difference. You can't treat superior people and inferior people the same way, right? Because the values are different. Oliver didn't answer, but it wasn't an expression of understanding. No. It was an expression that did not understand a single word of what Marie said. Marie described it as if she was treating a three-year-old child. Ah, uh, how do I explain this? Um, ah. How is life these days? Sleeping or eating? Oliver replied. A clean bed, a small desk, and sausages, hams, and bacon for every breakfast. After hearing his answer, Marie said with a bitter expression on her face. It's just like that. If even the informal disciple gets sausages every morning, do you think I and the other kids will try and work hard? Furthermore, we would not have tried to become a warlock at all. Oliver tilted his head once more. Ah. Uh. So, is Supervisor Marie learning black magic to eat sausages? At the stupid question that flew in again, Marie was dumbfounded and touched her forehead. It was an incredibly disrespectful gesture for an informal disciple to do to a formal disciple, but seeing Oliver's stupid attitude, she couldn't help it. No. Do you think people learn black magic for sausage and ham? Ah. I'm really curious, why is Oliver learning black magic? Because it's fun. An answer without a single hesitation. Marie was so confused that she didn't even dare to argue. Marie shook her head and spoke again. I don't learn for that. There is a more practical reason. Practical reason? Oliver was interested. Originally, Marie wouldn't have answered, but for some reason, she answered without knowing. Because this is my only hope, said Marie. Hope? Yeah, it was the only hope for someone at the bottom of society like me. If I become a warlock, I can become strong enough to live without anyone looking down on me. Ha! Huh. I think you wouldn't be able to relate. And most of the people here practice black magic for the same reason as mine rather than the reasons like Oliver's. Oliver didn't bother speaking. He looked at her feelings and knew she was sincere. Of course, he didn't sympathize with her words, but her emotions were interesting. So, does Supervisor Marie want to become a warlock to become stronger? Of course. I wouldn't be belittled for being a woman, and I could wipe out all the asterisk holes who look down on me by myself. I can make a lot more money, the warlock, although people are wary of them, at least they aren't ignored. Oliver listened to Marie with interest. While Marie was speaking, her emotions fluctuated, and the light in which many emotions were intertwined looked quite pretty. Have you seen it by yourself? What? You said warlocks are strong. 
have you ever seen them fight? Marie pondered for a moment, and then she opened her mouth very carefully. It was as if she was opening a gift wrapper. Once, when I was picked up by the master. The fearless neighborhood B asterisk starts had an argument, the master didn't even flick an eyebrow and finished it all. On the spot. It was amazing. Up until that point, no one could ever say anything to them even though those bastards did all sorts of things, at that time I was completely shocked. So I'm trying to become a warlock. To become strong like our master. Oliver nodded his head curiously. Marie smiled humbly as if embarrassed by the delay. I'm not going to talk about this anymore. It's a bit embarrassing. Yeah, okay. He had already heard everything he wanted, so Oliver graciously accepted. Marie narrowed her eyes as if displeased with the reply. Is there any problem? Ha ha. No. It's all right. Then, can you help me with my studies now that you've finished learning to write? Oh, yes. Oliver answered right away, pushed the notebook and pencil to the side, and sat down on the floor cross-legged. His posture was quite stable, and Marie also sat cross-legged just like Oliver did. Well, excuse me for a moment. Yes. As soon as Oliver got an answer, he reached out to Marie and extracted her emotions. A small group of light gathered at Oliver's fingertips, and the light regained its stability in an instant. His control over the light was as skillful as breathing, and he seemed to have already surpassed even an intermediate disciple in controlling the emotions. Admiring the ghostly skill, Marie put her hands together, and Oliver placed her emotions on them. Try to stabilize it. As soon as Oliver said it, the emotions that had stabilized fluctuated and tried to unravel. Marie frowned and focused her mind on her fingertips. The emotions were more difficult than dealing with the emotions extracted from the flask, but the emotions slowly regained their stability showing that her efforts so far were not in vain. Marie took a shallow breath, and sweat appeared on her forehead. But it was just the beginning. Now make a shape. Ah, uh, conical? Without saying anything, Marie immediately manipulated the emotions. The emotions which floated in the air fluctuated for a moment, and then slowly began to change into a cone. Well, this time make it a diamond. He threw another demand, Marie reinvigorated herself and tried to change the emotions, it was harder than the first, but Oliver didn't mind and the order continued. Now square. Circle again. This time in the shape of a star. In the shape of a donut. Well, this time. Wait a minute. Drenched in a cold sweat, Marie said urgently. She breathed heavily, feeling exhausted. It seemed difficult for her to stabilize the emotions any longer. Now, can we just take a break for a second? It's hard. This time, let's make it into the shape of a cobweb. Oliver ignored Marie's words, and she tried to say it again, but Oliver spoke adamantly. The cobweb. The pressure was hard to explain. Marie, who was exhausted, concentrated her mind and crudely created the shape of a cobweb. But before long, the shape began to collapse, and at that moment, Oliver placed his hands around Marie's hands as if they were overlapping. What now? Nothing, just concentrate. At Oliver's words, Marie focused again. The unstable emotions regained their composure and turned into a cobweb, with which she felt a surprising sensation. Through Oliver and his folded hands, she could indirectly feel how Oliver helped, it was a mysterious experience that she had never felt before. If she had to compare it, it was like someone holding you from behind when you were learning to ride a bicycle. The cobweb is complete, said Marie. Although the lines were thick and the spacing between the lines was wide, it was just a clumsy cobweb, but still, it was completed somehow. Marie looked at Oliver cautiously, which was unlike her. As she was in the position of being taught, she started looking at him without her knowing, and fortunately, Oliver seemed to be somewhat satisfied. Um, well done. The compliment surprisingly pleased Marie. 
Oh, thank you. Would you like to relax your hands for a moment? Yes? As soon as she answered, her hand trembled. Upon inspection, it turned out that Oliver was manipulating emotions through Marie's hands, while he was making a web. Not a clumsy cobweb, like the one Marie made, but a very sophisticated cobweb with hundreds of fine threads intertwined. This is. Concentrate. Marie shut her mouth and focused her attention according to Oliver's instructions. And as if indulging, she felt the cobwebs being made one by one. It was a delicate and beautiful feeling that cannot be described in words. As the layers of the cobwebs formed, Oliver opened his mouth. Do you know roughly how to do it? Ah, yes. Even though I did not understand everything, I think I understand a little bit. Then, when you are alone, keep reminding yourself of that feeling, and imagine it in your head. Imagine? Yeah, that would be of some help. Remember, we will only practice this next time. Oliver finished talking and looked at his watch. He still didn't know how to see time, but he could tell the difference between small and long hands. The small needle is on one. The long needle is on four. I'll get going. The leader told me to come to the back side of the factory when the small needle reached one and the long needle reached six. What? What's going on? I don't know. They said they were going to gather ingredients. Ah, the ingredients? You know something? Probably, they are going to gather ingredients for a product. You mean for sausage? No, it's a real product. Probably, you will be moving with the intermediate disciples. Listen carefully and be careful. Oh, okay. Then, I will go. Oliver walked away without looking back. Seeing this, Marie felt strange. Is that it? Without realizing it, she called him. Oliver. Yes? That. Be careful, Anne. Thank you for teaching me. Oliver looked at the face of Marie and replied. Yes, Supervisor Marie too worked hard. And then he walked again. Genius 11 behind Joseph's sausage factory, several children gathered. They were about 16 to 19 years old. Their attire varied, but the common thing was that they were not well dressed. Some wore dresses that were out of fashion a long time ago and some wore dresses that did not fit their body. The children talked to each other without caring about their dress as if they were already used to it. Hasn't it been a long time since we went to gather ingredients? Yes, there was the master's trip and so on, thus the schedule got delayed. Would you like to walk around for a while? Well, I'm fine, but is it okay to go out? Maybe, it's all right. If we're lucky, we can save some money and eat something delicious. I want to eat something called ice cream. I heard that it's popular in Landa, right now. Is there a place that sells such things in this neighborhood? It was noisy, and the two room leaders who were checking the number of people suddenly shouted. What the F asterisk CK? It's one person short, who's it damn it, said the room leader, irritatingly. Although ingredient collection is a chore, it's definitely an important part of the family business. So they couldn't believe that one of the junior disciples hadn't taken the job seriously. Thus the room leader had no choice but to lose his temper. They are the ones who will get in trouble if they are caught by intermediate disciples. Leader A raised his voice more irritatingly. Which one is late? Everybody, get up on your feet. Let me check. Then, leader B interjected. Calm down, I know who's late. Who? Which F asterisk cur messed with the rules? It's. What? It's him. Hearing the words leader A's anger cooled down sharply. Recently, there was only one person who's referred to as him by the junior disciples. He became a formal disciple in less than ten days after he came in and literally killed one person in the process. And when everyone was silent hearing who wasn't there, a voice was heard. Hello. 
Oliver trudged in and greeted. All the junior disciples who had come first didn't open their mouths in response. Originally, it would have been right to be angry that the youngest disciple was coming late, but no one did. They were pretending not to be angry, remembering the last duel between Oliver and Tom. But there was a courageous man among the group. The person in charge, Leader B, managed to open his mouth. Why, why are you so late? Oliver said, showing the watch on his wrist. Short needle on one, the long needle on six. Didn't you say that was the time to gather? The room leader looked at the watch. That's true, but as the youngest member, you have to come out earlier. Oh. I'm sorry. Oliver bowed his head immediately and begged for forgiveness. Begging really didn't mean much for Oliver. This was normal in the orphanage and mine. However, the room leader smiled faintly because he thought he had kept his dignity. Well, be careful next time. As soon as it was about to end well, a third voice intervened. What do you mean by be careful next time? Everyone turned their heads in the direction of the sound. There were intermediate disciples there. Ah. Slap. What do you mean by that? Tell me what do you mean by be careful next time? The intermediate disciple asked, hitting the leader again in the face. Since when has discipline in our family been this lax? If it were me, I would have beat the sh asterisk t out of the guy for being a little late. Like this. The intermediate disciple kicked Oliver in the chest. I'm just curious, is it supposed to be like this? Or are you only soft on this guy? You're not scared, are you? The intermediate disciple who kicked Oliver asked interrogatively. The leader was almost in tears when another intermediate disciple intervened. Come on, stop, we got work to do today. Only then did the intermediate disciple who kicked Oliver stopped. The mediator briefly explained today's schedule to change the mood and reached out to Oliver, who collapsed. Are you all right? Oliver looked at him. A man with dark brown hair who gave a likable impression on the outside, though not at all on the inside. Yes, thank you. Oliver replied, holding hands. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. Ingredient collection is the collection of emotions and materials necessary for the family business, and the work was done by intermediate and junior disciples. It was done in a group of three, one intermediate disciple, and two junior disciples. In principle, a group of three had to travel around each assigned area, while the actual work was done by the intermediate disciple, the junior disciple should learn the process, and was also in charge of miscellaneous work. Do you understand? said an intermediate disciple who helped Oliver and the leader. The intermediate disciple's name was Rasso. While being scolded by other intermediate disciples, he not only helped the leader and Oliver but also nominated them for assisting him with ingredient collection. The room leader bowed his head in a panic. Oh, thank you so much for your help. Oliver bowed his head along with the room leader. Thank you very much. Rasso said, waving modestly. No, no, no. I chose it because I wanted you to be comfortable. Peter, you're famous for your hard work, and Oliver, who's famous these days. Are you okay where you got hit? Oliver replied with a nod. Yes, I'm fine. Thank you for your help. No, no. If you really feel thankful, you can pay me back when you get out in the world. You look very talented. Rasso said, waving his hand and laughing. But Oliver kept on bowing. Well, okay, let's start. Since everyone left. The schedule is not tight, but just in case. Have you got everything we need? The room leader immediately checked and answered. Yes. I've got the test tube bag, and here's the money, and here's the mask. Rasso checked his arm, and then he said. Let's all wear the mask. Peter looked at the leather mask and handed the most handsome one to Rasso, and the other one to Oliver. 
Oliver looked at the leather mask, and then noticed something strange. It was not just a leather mask, but a face that seemed to be peeled off from a person's face. This is. Just put it on. Oliver looked at the mask and put it on his face casually. Then a startling sensation arose. Not only his face but also his whole body felt the touch of a leather mask. Oliver looked at his hand unconsciously. The pale and thin arms disappeared completely, and instead, black and thick forearms were there. Oliver pressed his arm with curiosity. It was similar to adding a mask, but it felt somewhat strange, and it was not uncomfortable. It's a black magic item called, Fake Face. It not only changes your face but also your body. It's more like a mask all over your body. With Rasso's kind explanation, Oliver was intrigued. He couldn't believe that something like this could be done with black magic. A thump was felt in Oliver's cold heart. Is this the product? The product? Oh, to a certain extent? But it's not the main item. Fake faces are expensive, so bank robbers and gangsters buy them every once in a while. The main product is separate. What is it? Oliver asked again. Peter stopped Oliver as if saying it was inappropriate, but Rasso smiled and gestured as if it was okay. No, it's okay. If you want to be a warlock, you have to have that much desire to explore. But not everyone thinks it's good, so you have to be careful. Yes, you're right. I'll teach him properly. Peter bowed instead of Oliver. Nevertheless, Oliver wanted to hear an answer, so Rasso thought for a while and opened his mouth. Ah. Uh, we have work to do. I'll let you know on the way. What do you think? Oliver bowed his head and answered yes. Rasso laughed and said as if he liked the look very much. Okay, follow me. We'll go to our area. Oliver followed with a briefcase containing the test tubes. Oliver didn't know where the area was, but he followed diligently, and suddenly Peter approached Oliver and whispered in a small voice. You're lucky. What? Peter looked at the back of Rasso and said again quietly. You're lucky, junior disciples should never talk back to an intermediate disciple. Since sir. Rasso was nice, he didn't mind it. Don't do that again. Nice. Oliver looked at Rasso. No, his feelings, exactly. Hm, nice. Why shouldn't the junior disciples talk back? That's the rule. Our family values rules and order. Subordinates must obey their superiors. Oliver nodded. It was the same in the orphanage and the mine. However, unlike then, there were so many questions that Oliver wanted to ask now. What are you whispering about? asked Rasso, who was walking in front of them. Peter answered hastily. Nothing, sir. Rasso smiled as if he was fine. Ha, ah, don't be so nervous. Just think that we're going for a walk. Yes, sir. Moreover, Oliver. I told you earlier that I would tell you what the product is. Yes. It's hard to explain right away, so first, let's begin our job. Saying that Rasso took a notebook out of his pocket and examined it. Shall we start here? Let's see. 112A on Paul Street. Rasso murmured, examining the cluttered inn, and went into a small, dirty place, and as soon as he entered, a strange stench reached everyone's nose. Who is it? An old woman who was believed to be the owner came out and asked. The age spots around her eyes were quite repulsive. Rasso replied to her naturally. Is the fruit ripe? The old woman's eyes flinched and she replied. I've cooked three. Can you show me around? I'd like to have a taste of it. Follow me. The party of three followed the old woman up to the second floor in a narrow hallway. There were three small rooms and the sounds of children could be heard from each room. The old woman knocked on the door. It's me, are you there? After a while, with a squeak, the door slowly opened. 
Someone peeped out through the crack in the door. Landlord madam. What brings you? Huh? Oh, nothing, the one I told you about before. That one. They're here. Open the door. Oliver saw a faint emotion through the small gap. The emotion was trembling with fear. However, as soon as she was ready, the door opened, and a woman who was just before the transition from girl to woman appeared. There was a baby in her arms, and it seemed like she was breastfeeding until a while ago. These people, she asked, frightenedly. The old woman reassured her. Don't worry. As I told you earlier, it's not dangerous for the baby. Think of it as just blood donation. The woman looked afraid but soon closed her eyes tightly as if she had no choice. Please. He. How is it? Is it okay? When asked by the old woman, Rasso raised two fingers so that only the old woman could see them. The old woman nodded in acknowledgement, and Rasso ordered Oliver. Can I have a test tube? Oliver opened the briefcase and held out an empty test tube. After receiving the test tube, Rasso reached out to calm the woman. It doesn't hurt, there are no side effects, so don't worry. Rasso said, extracting her emotions. The emotions was none other than love for the baby, motherhood. The light was very beautiful and warm. Oliver admired for a moment, and when the test tube was about a one-third RD full, Rasso stopped extracting. Ugh. The woman sat down, exhaling an unfamiliar sensation and a somewhat absent-minded feeling. However, when she saw the bundle of money offered by Rasso, she soon came to her senses. Is this? We told you, we'll pay you a lot, didn't we? The woman, distracted by the bundle of money, nodded. Rasso after greeting politely handed over the extracted motherhood to Oliver. Then, I look forward to your kind cooperation next time. The woman clasped the bundle of money and nodded her head. As the party came out of the room, they went to the other two rooms to extract motherhood from the single mothers in the same way. When they came back down from work, Rasso gave the old woman more money than what he had given to three single mothers. Thank you, huh? The money is less than before? Rasso replied to the old woman's question. Didn't you know? As much as we pay the right price, we're picky about quality. The lady in the last room isn't very good anymore. That's right, that's right. Okay, she'll be out of the room sooner or later, looking for another mother, right? Yes, if you get the right stuff, I'll give you extra. The old woman nodded her head and said, Okay. Rasso came out after greeting her, and after coming out, he said to Oliver. Did you take care of the emotions? Yes. That's the ingredient to make a product. Do you know what it is? Oliver shook his head. Rasso said with a smile. It's called Pilgaret. Genius 12. Pilgaret. It was said to be the main product of the Joseph family, no, for the majority of a warlock family. What's a pilgaret? Do you happen to know about cigarettes? It's similar to that. But it's only similar in appearance, the contents are very much different. I don't know how to explain it because there's so much to talk about. Rasso pretended to be worried as he talked like a salesman. Then he opened his mouth again. Pilgaret is a kind of health drug. The quality varies depending on the maker, but it's a great thing. Pleasure is greater than most drugs, and there are few side effects. No, it's a special medicine for depressed patients these days, so it's rather good for their health. Oliver didn't understand, so Rasso explained again, pointing to the briefcase. How's the emotion in there? The motherhood of beautiful mothers who were alone but didn't abandon their children. Ah, beautiful. Isn't it? Once it's processed and inhaled, it's even better than a potion boiled stimulant. On top of that, there is little fear of being caught and no side effects. It was hard to understand because it was something completely unknown to Oliver, still, his curiosity arose, 
thinking that emotions can not only be used for black magic, but also for something like this. Oliver became curious about the production process and the actual effect. Is this the only ingredient we will be extracting? No, it's not. There are many different kinds of pilgrimage. And it's not only the pilgrimage that's our source of income. I'll tell you more about it as we move. As soon as Rasso finished, he started moving again, and Oliver followed him. This time, they went to the basement in a back alley. The basement was filled with a pungent smell, and at a distance, they saw a locked iron door and a bald guard guarding it. While looking at a book with a naked woman on it, the guard grunted at the appearance of strangers. Who is it? Get out of here. The bald man picked up Blackjack and his waist as if it were not just a warning. Blackjack with a metal ball on one end. As long as the person wasn't a fool, he could easily guess that even if he was hit once by it, his head would explode. Rasso said. Have you collected enough dried leaves? The bald man lifted his face and put in the blackjack. Then he pressed the buzzer on the wall. Inside the basement, a little beep was heard. As soon as the sound was heard, the locked iron door opened. The security guard beckoned inside, and Rasso bowed politely and went down. Further down Oliver saw a cellar. There was nothing to pay particular attention to, except for the musty sweet smell. You are here? A man in his fifties with half-gray, half-black hair and gold-rimmed glasses greeted them. How are you? Pharmacist. Yes, yes. Welcome. I thought it was time for you to come. As if they knew each other well, Rasso talked to the man called Pharmacist, and then he guided Rasso somewhere. Of course, Oliver and Peter followed whispering and chatting along the way. Who is he? Who? Pharmacist? I don't know. He's our family's big dealer. I've heard that he's also dealing with other families. Are there other families? Of course there is. How can it be just us? Kachak. Here you go, said the pharmacist, opening the door at the end of the hallway. When he opened the door, Oliver saw a room that was like a warehouse. There was only one white light bulb lit up in the room, and beneath it were the shabby people sitting on their knees. All the dried leaves I've got. The books are here, so check them yourself. Okay. After finishing his conversation with the pharmacist, Rasso looked at people and books alternately as if he was looking at things. It seemed quite familiar, and in the meantime, Oliver asked Peter what the dry leaves were. Peter answered kindly. Debtors with no money to pay off their debts. All they have is their body. So we'll pick the one who's in good condition, and we'll pay off the debt and extract a little bit of life force instead. As Oliver was about to ask what life force was, Rasso opened his mouth. This person, this person, and everything except this person is on us. What, what, asked the person not picked by Rasso in bewilderment. But instead of answering, only a rough touch returned. He was dragged away somewhere, looking very frightened. Of course, it wasn't like the chosen ones were relieved. They also looked around as if they were afraid but nevertheless, they were overwhelmed by the atmosphere and did nothing. Rasso smiled at them and said, Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you all. I can't tell you who I am because of personal reasons, but I'd like to make a good offer to you. Before I get to the point, everyone owes a lot of debt here, right? Some people nodded looking around. We'll pay back all those debts for you, right now. Instead, Give us a little bit of life force. Life force. The heavy word surprised the debtors. Then, the pharmacist stepped in. It looks skillful and familiar. Don't be so afraid. You'll just be losing some energy. If you eat well and rest well, you will be able to recover. Still, the debtors looked at each other as if they were not relieved. Then a timid looking fat man quietly raised his hand and asked, Life force. Is it dangerous? It's okay as long as it's not taking too much. 
Rather, it is more dangerous if you don't pay off your debts while your interests continue to accumulate. This is my choice, if you don't like it, you can pay back your debt right away and leave. The debtors couldn't say anything at the pharmacist's words. They were sold here because they couldn't pay their debts. As the atmosphere became gloomy, Rasso stepped in once again. I'm sure you'll feel uncomfortable for a while, but you won't die. We don't want to kill people. If you don't like it, tell me. I won't force you. But I'm sure it's a lot more profitable in the long run if you pay off your debts now. It wasn't much, but it was enough for those who owed a lot of money. Eventually, reluctantly, everyone agreed, and Rasso reached out and began extracting life force one by one. Oliver took a closer look at the figure. Unlike emotions, life force was not around the body, but on the inside of the body, and it was similar to emotions but strangely different. Okay. It's over. Hi. Hick. Hick. The man whose life force was sucked out breathed as if he was exhausted. Rasso said, closing the test tube in which the extracted life force was filled. Take a good rest for a while, eat and get enough sleep. Yes, you'll recover soon. The person involved was too tired to listen, while Rasso approached the second person without caring. The frightened debtor said urgently. Now, wait a minute. Yes, it will be over in a minute. Rasso interrupted and started extracting the life force. The people whose life force was sucked out lose weight in real time, and the bizarre sight made the debtors tremble. It was scary, but there was no hope since they had no way for paying off the debt. Rasso, who also completed the second extraction, said as he passed over the test tube, it's your first time seeing life force? Yes. This is the mystery of dark magic. When one ends, another one comes out. Ha, ah, that's true. Peter answered flatly. Oliver just stared curiously, and Rasso suddenly made a suggestion, as if on a whim. Do you guys want to try? What? Peter was surprised. Ha. Ah. Sir. Rasso is good at joking, too. Don't you know we haven't learned it yet? At that moment, Oliver asked, with a sparkle in his eyes. Can I really try? Ha! Huh. Someone's surprised voice was heard. The one who was surprised was not only Peter but also Rasso. Why? Can you do it? Did you learn? No, but I can do it from what I just saw. Unlike Oliver's usual absent-minded attitude, his voice felt confident, no, more than that, it was so determined. Rasso asked earnestly. Can you really do it? It's not a game, you can't just say, I made a mistake, later. Then I can do it if I did it without making a mistake? Yes, but... All right, you're so confident. Try it. Instead, never make a mistake. Pharmacist. May I ask this child? The pharmacist only shrugged. As long as you compensate for the damage. Rasso showed the books and the test tubes as if he really intended to make Oliver do it, and told him how much life force he had to draw depending on the debt. Oliver just nodded as if he really understood. Okay, then try it. Debtor, who instinctively noticed the dangerous situation, looked at Oliver with a scared look. But, Oliver didn't care a bit and extended his hands in the air. Wait, not that many. Before Rasso could finish his words, the life force of all the remaining debtors was extracted at the same time. The extracted life force which spread in the air was brought together. Shusish. As the number of people was large, the life force was large, huge, and shiny and it was not easy to control, not only for the intermediate disciples but also for the senior disciples. For some reason, Oliver did not have a hard time at all, after extracting the life force, he stabilized it in his hands, and said. Is this okay? At Oliver's usual expression, Rasso nodded with a silly face. Not only successfully extracting the life force that he hasn't learned, but Oliver was also good at handling it all at once. 
Rasso had no idea of what to say. Sir. I'm sorry, but can you open the lid of the test tube? Peter, who was mesmerized, got surprised and opened the lid of the test tube hearing the voice of Oliver. Oliver filled the life force exactly to the point, while Rasso looked at the debtors who were losing their life. The amount of life force extracted was exactly as mentioned in the books. Even though he picked ignorantly all at once, there was no problem with precision. No, this precision was difficult even if Rasso did it one by one. Talent. Can this really be categorized as talent? Rasso felt as if he was watching a monster at work. Oliver transferred the life force to the test tube without any hesitation. In the eyes of Rasso, the figure of Oliver felt like a monster that would break down the existing family order at once. Sir. Rasso? Yes, yes. What? Do you have something to say? Yes, what is this life force used for? To the question of the monster, which was filled with nothing but curiosity, Rasso replied with a smile. I'll tell you on the way. Genius 13. Nutritional supplements, asked Oliver, who was walking with a briefcase. Rasso nodded. Yes, all of this life force will be processed into nutritional supplements. It's not always possible to make it as a nutritional supplement, but these days, it's efficient to make it. Oliver, an outsider, didn't understand much about the business. Rasso kindly explained in more detail. Do you know who the main customers are? No. That's the rich in Landa. You know where Landa is, right? Oliver fumbled. He had heard of it once. When he arrived here in Wineham with Joseph, he talked about Landa once. Wineham's factories are all moving to Landa. I've heard of it. Really? So you know that now Landa is developing rapidly, eating up here and the surrounding cities? Oliver nodded again. In a rapidly developing city, there are a lot of rich people. Of course, there are more poor people, but anyway, most of Landa's rich are older fat people, and they're not very healthy even though they're rich. So they pay a lot of money to buy nutritional supplements made with life force. After all, life is more important than money. Oliver nodded as if he understood roughly. So this life force is one of our family's major products, like Pilgaret. As demand continues to grow, this market has a bright outlook. Rasso said like a confident businessman. Meanwhile, Peter carefully intervened and flattered. Ha, ah, that's great. The bright market outlook means that demand will increase. The family is going to be more prosperous. Peter was just trying to make him look good, but Rasso took it more seriously than he thought. Yes, but just an increase in demand is not good. We need to increase the supply to meet demand. Supply? Yeah, a bottle of nutritional supplements costs a fortune, but that's also when the product is perfect. If the quality is lowered to increase the quantity, the deal will get cut off immediately. So we have to be careful. Oh, that's a big deal. Actually, it's not that big of a deal. What? The point is whether we can get the ingredients right, but it's pretty hopeful given the situation in this city. It was ironic. The only city streets they've seen on their way were closed shops, factories, and houses that exude poverty, but Rasso said it was hopeful. Rasso continued. I know what you're thinking. The word hopeful doesn't belong to this poor city. But that shows how immature you are. Poverty is surprisingly good for black magicians. Tell me. What would happen if all the factories in this city moved to Landa? Peter answered seriously like a disciple in a class. Ah, there'll be many poor, won't they? Yeah. So, will everyone leave for Landa looking for a job? That's not the case. Many will leave, but nonetheless, there will be many left here. It's not that easy to leave for another place. Then we can use reliable brokers to pay them some money and extract life force. Soon the whole city will be our ingredient. Hearing that Peter's eyes shone. 
that's a great insight. As expected, an intermediate disciple is different from the lower class disciples like us. Actually, I only heard it from Andrew. I got beaten by the atmosphere and wanted to brag. Now, I'm a little embarrassed. No, Senior is still amazing. Anyway, don't tell this to anyone, I especially told you guys, keep it to yourself. It's not a secret, but there's nothing good if a lot of people knew about it. Peter smiled slightly at the word. Special. For Peter, who served as a room leader for most of his life, the words of Rasso, an outstanding disciple among intermediate disciples, were like a great praise. In reality, even if it meant nothing. We're almost there. That's a relief. We arrived before dinner. By the way, what's going on over there, said Rasso, looking at the busy crowd in front of the factory far away. It was chaotic, and everyone seemed scared and confused. Hey, what's going on? Rasso approached and grabbed a busy and moving informal disciple and asked. When he looked at him, there was some blood on the informal disciple's work clothes. It's, it's. I don't know what it is, but someone attacked the official disciples. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. The conference room in the basement of the sausage factory. Joseph, the family boss, and five of his senior disciples gathered there. Everyone had a serious expression, and it was Joseph who opened his mouth first. Report. Andrew, the best among the senior disciples, replied. Yes, master. An unidentified mysterious group attacked our family today during the ingredient collection. Three out of ten teams were attacked. In total, one junior disciple was injured and two junior disciples died. Fortunately, all the intermediate disciples are fine. Andrew's voice was relatively bright. In fact, in a way, it was natural. The junior disciples were of little use because they could barely use black magic, whereas the intermediate disciples were practical forces that could be used in actual combat. Moreover, even if the junior disciples died, they could be roughly selected from the informal disciples and would be able to fill the vacancy immediately. Joseph thought it over and opened his mouth. How did they get attacked? It was done the same way. As they walked through the street, suddenly someone appeared, shot at them, and ran away. They couldn't even catch a single one? Yes, they were already gone when they followed them. I think they know the geography of this place very well, and maybe one of the families is picking a fight with us? The other family that Andrew told was two other warlock families here in Wineham. The Anthony family specialized in manipulation, and the Dominic family specialized in disease. In the past, Joseph had a dispute with the two families, but after reconciling with the pharmacists' involvement, they were now quietly operating in their respective areas. Isn't it an attack because our family continues to grow? Joseph shook his head. No, this kind of half-assed raid isn't their way. It's annoying, but it didn't do much damage, did it? If it's them they would have made a more proper attack. So who? I don't know that yet. I heard that there are all kinds of bugs running around because of the noise of Landa, the concern is whether to catch this bug or not. If there was enough time, Joseph would have ordered them to catch these fearless guys, considering the status of his family, but now, things weren't good. The product delivery date was nearing. Considering the business, he had to hand it over in time, so he had to use the available force to focus on production. First of all, let's focus on production. We can catch a bug later since it has nothing to do with our business. A senior disciple raised his hand. I don't think the attack will end with this one time, can we really focus on production? Moreover, we have not yet received enough ingredients, and if something were to happen to an intermediate disciple, we will be short-handed. That's true. Andrew raised his hand when Joseph was immersed in his thoughts. Andrew's eyes flashed as if he had an idea. Then, why don't we leave the collection of the ingredients to the lower class and put the intermediate disciples into production like us? 
everyone's eyes were on Andrew. In the past few years, ingredient collection has been conducted under the leadership of intermediate disciples along with the junior disciples, but Andrew's proposal was to break that tradition. How come? If we put intermediate disciples in the production of products, we'll be able to meet the deadline faster, and we can prepare for the unexpected. When Joseph remained silent, Andrew continued to persuade him. I've heard from some intermediate disciples that junior disciples can extract some ingredients. At this time, I don't think it's a bad idea to increase their role. Above all, there won't be a great deal of damage even if some of the lower disciples die, isn't it? His words were way over the line, but no one denied it, because junior disciples were only slightly better than the informal disciples and their position could be filled at any time. Then, a senior disciple raised his hand. I honestly think it's okay. However, there's one big issue. What is it? If it's emotion, I can understand that the low-level disciples can extract it, but what about the life force? Andrew smiled brightly at that moment as if he was waiting for someone to ask this question. Don't worry about it. I heard an interesting story from Rasso. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. After dinner, everyone had a personal maintenance time. Usually, most of them rested at this time while some chatted with the people they are close with, but the atmosphere right now was somewhat dark, perhaps because of what happened today. It wasn't so strange, because someone was after the family. Since they might be the ones who could get killed tomorrow if they were unlucky, it was a grave concern for everyone, except for one. Oliver, who was speaking to Marie. Ah, that's why he got hurt a lot. Yeah, I've seen a person getting shot a few times in my hometown, but it's been a while since I've been here. Oh, really? But it's getting out of shape. Oliver said, looking at Marie's web. Marie came back to her senses with a blunder. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's all right. It's better than the first time. The strangely divergent conversation meant that the two had different interests. Marie focused on today's attack, but Oliver focused consistently on black magic, like a fire moth that only responds to light. You really don't care about anything. What? No, nothing. How about this? Marie said, showing the finished web. It's noticeably better than before, and she didn't just imitate the form, it looked like a real spider web. It could be said to be a great development. It's good. Marie smiled hearing Oliver's reply. She felt like her efforts were appreciated. Marie knew that it was not just her own effort that made it possible, it couldn't have been possible without Oliver's help than her own effort. Oliver continued to help her, corrected her, and improved the wrong parts so that she could achieve the current level. Indeed, it was amazing. The results she achieved over the past few days were way more than what she achieved with her efforts alone in the past six years. It was really great. But this part is better. Oliver said, pointing at Marie's web. The central axis of the spider web was divided into five branches, turning into a more complex and robust form. This is better. Do you understand? Oh, yes. Thank you. No, thank you. If you don't mind, can I borrow it for a while? Oliver took Marie's emotions back in his hands. The barely made model of Marie's web quickly regained stability when it got transferred to Oliver's hand. In the past, Marie was jealous of Oliver's talent, but as she kept looking at him, she didn't feel that way anymore. Jealousy is possible only when there's a certain level of difference. Marie said again as she looked at Oliver making the spider web. Thank you very much. No, thank you. I get help with this and that. You already learned letters and numbers, right? Oliver has long learned everything Marie can teach, such as writing, reading, and number calculation at an amazing learning speed. Nevertheless, he continued to teach Marie. Ah, not about that, but this one. Oliver said, 
pointing at Marie's emotion in his hands. I can practice little because Supervisor Marie lets me extract her emotions. Oliver replied, removing the spider web model and making a sphere. It's really nothing. It doesn't matter if it's a small amount. No, I can't even extract that small amount from me. What? I can make a shape at my fingertips, but I can't extract my emotions. Before coming here, the master said that my emotions are weaker than others. I think I can't extract it because of that. Oh. It was the first time Marie heard about it. So I had to extract other people's emotions, and Supervisor Marie helped me with that. It would have been depressing if it weren't for Supervisor Marie. Speak comfortably without honorifics. Now, you are in a position higher than mine. No, I'm comfortable with honorifics. Oliver said sincerely. From his experience in life, he felt that anyone who spoke formally could avoid getting beaten. But regardless, Marie seemed to be somewhat disappointed. Well, then, feel free to tell me whenever you want to extract emotion. Yes. A short, emotionless answer. Soon Oliver became silent and focused all his attention on the emotions in his hand. Marie also followed Oliver and looked at the emotions, and there was nothing special, except for the slight flinch of the sphere. Eventually, Marie said, unable to bear the silence. How is it today? You went to collect ingredients, right? Oliver replied calmly about how he followed Rasso, how Rasso extracted the maternal love of unmarried mothers, and about the pharmacist, where he extracted the life force of the debtors. Wait a minute. Did you extract life force? Oliver? Oliver nodded. How? You wouldn't be able to learn to extract life force until you're an intermediate disciple? Oliver couldn't reply since he felt like she was asking as if how is he breathing. It seemed so obvious that he couldn't explain it, but Marie was amazed and worried at the same time. Hey, Oliver. Yes. Be careful. What? I know Oliver is a genius, but it's dangerous if you reveal all your talent too early. Oliver turned his head and made eye contact with Marie. Dangerous? Yes. Marie stopped talking and looked around. No one knows if the junior disciple, who was originally in Oliver's place, really died of food poisoning. Marie said with a frown when Oliver didn't understand. Maybe. Beep. 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 Suddenly, a broadcast signal rang out throughout the factory. Ugh. Ugh. Oliver. Oliver. Come to the master's office right away. I'll repeat again, Oliver. Oliver got up from his seat, looked at Marie, and said. I'll go. Oh, yeah, have a safe trip. Genius 14. A few days later, the collection of ingredients resumed. However, there was one thing that was different, it was the junior disciples instead of the intermediate disciples who were assigned for the job. The reason for that was the improvement in the efficiency of production, responsibility improvement, and training for junior disciples by expanding their duties. But the junior disciples knew that it was nothing but an empty excuse. They know that the burden of collecting ingredients was handed over to the junior disciples in order to save the lives of the relatively valuable intermediate disciples. They felt like if they were going to replace the duties, they should have at least told the truth. However, there was nothing the junior disciples could do just because they knew what was going on inside. In the world of Warlock, if the superiors gave an order, it should be followed, not questioned. They had to just bow down their heads to express their gratitude for the increase in missions, and for the chance to practice how to extract emotions. But there was one exception, Oliver, who was glad that he could practice more black magic. Shoo! It's over! Oliver said while closing the test tube that contained the life force. He handed over the test tube to Peter, who put the tubes into his bag, took a few round bundles of money from a sling bag, and gave them to a man with gold teeth and sunglasses. 
The man who called himself a loan shark laughed with an airy smile, then took out a couple of bundles of money as a commission, and then handed three or four bills to the person whose life force was drained. Let's go. Ha. Huh. Goodbye. I hope to see you again next time. Peter felt uncomfortable at the attitude of the loan shark, so he took Oliver and hurriedly paced his steps. After they left the shabby building and walked for some time, Peter sighed and looked through the list. Ha! Huh. Oh no! What's wrong? After eating in the morning, we've started doing the work, and we've been running around the clock all day, but still, I don't see a way to reduce the workload. Oliver and Peter had a workload that was several times more than that of other junior disciples. The reason for this was, except for Oliver, there were no junior disciples who were able to extract life force. Oliver was okay because the work itself was fun, but it was never okay for his sidekick, Peter. Not long ago, he saw two junior disciples drenched in blood after getting attacked by the raiders. He felt very uneasy. The range of movement was wide, so there was a high possibility of being attacked. Above all, his stomach was growling. Peter checked the time when he felt his stomach growling. It was 1.20 p.m. He missed lunchtime because he was working. Peter took Oliver out of the back alley and into the main street. The once crowded streets were noticeably less crowded, more than half of the buildings were empty and the house with boards on the windows filled the street. Still, there was one thing that didn't change, the hot dog booth in the square was still there. Wait a minute. Peter told Oliver and went to the hot dog booth. After a while, he came back with a hot dog with mustard and pickles on it. Have one of these. Oliver ate as Peter said, while Peter filled his stomach with hot dogs. While eating, there was no conversation between the two, but Peter looked at Oliver, who was silent, and thought that geniuses were supposed to be like this. He came in as an informal disciple and became a formal disciple in less than ten days, easily surpassing him who had been here for several years. However, what bothered him the most was that he didn't know what was going on inside Oliver's head. Appearing gloomy and sometimes even stupid, he usually seemed like any other informal disciple, but he was odd at times, which makes even a junior disciple like him shiver. His ability can surpass intermediate disciples, and even Andrew's man Rasso was nervous around him. Suddenly he remembered the astonished Rasso's face when Oliver pulled out the life force. It was impressive because he always kept his poker face. Peter felt that maybe it was a conspiracy that Oliver took this job, expecting him to meet the attackers and misfortunately die. It was nothing big of a shock. It was the law of the warlock world, to cut off the buds that might threaten their place. That's also the reason why Peter's been the room leader for a long time. But despite his efforts, now getting involved with Oliver might put his life in danger. If Oliver was really pushed into this job with the intention of getting him killed, then Peter might die as a bonus, yes, as a bonus. He felt frustrated because until a few days back, his life was smooth but now it felt like a ship that is getting swept away by the waves. What is that? While Peter was in deep thought Oliver asked suddenly, pointing in one direction with a childlike innocent, stupid face, where workers were protesting in shabby clothes dragging out their worn-out shoes. Moving factories is death. It's death. It's death. Give us our job. Our job. Our job. Our job. The protest by the 40 to 50-year-old workers seemed somewhat sad and difficult, but Peter frowned and shook his head. Do you remember what Senior Rasso said a few days ago? Which one? the city factories are moving to Landa. Yes. They are protesting not to do that since they will lose their job. Oliver nodded indifferently as if he really understood. The appearance made Peter uncomfortable because he didn't know what Oliver was thinking. Then, can't they just go to Landa? Looking for a job? Peter opened his mouth after an unusual silence. It's not that easy. Is it? Yes, it is. 
First of all, it's not easy to leave your home for some people, and even if they did leave, going to Landa doesn't really make things better. Can you explain it in detail? Peter thought for a moment, about whether to tell him or not, but it was not easy to refuse while looking at the curious expression on Oliver's face. Eventually, he opened his mouth thinking he was crazy. Landa used to be a growing city, but now it's growing faster. It's like a monster, so the map changes every day. A monster that eats the surrounding cities, towns, and fishing villages. Do you think people who get eaten by such monsters will be happy? No. That's right, 12 hours a day is a given, and sometimes they are made to work 18 hours a day. The kids are no different, but the money they give isn't good enough to fill even a rat's stomach, while most of the money is stolen in the name of rent. They will be squeezed from everywhere. How did you know? I've lived there, said Peter, even though he didn't want to say it. I originally lived in a small fishing village above Landa, and eventually got kicked out when a fishing factory came in. Our whole family went to Landa to find a job, and that's when hell began. Peter's eyes suddenly darkened when he recalled that time, the poverty and the suffering. Then did you follow the master and come here? Peter's eyebrows wriggled. It wasn't because he felt bad about Oliver interrupting him, it was because he was amazed by the boy who did not feel any empathy even after listening to his story. Ha! Huh. Yes. Master was looking for a talented child. He offered us money that we couldn't refuse, and eventually I got handed over to the master, but don't get me wrong, I'm glad that I'm here. Life is much better, and there is hope. If I learn black magic here, I will be able to run my own business someday. What Peter said at the end was a lie. He once dreamed of becoming independent as a warlock, but now it's all in the past. The reason is none other than internal competition. Competition in the warlock family was more intense and shady than he imagined, especially because of the faction that centered around Andrew, the family's second in command, and it was virtually impossible to get promoted. Realizing this, Peter effectively gave up his dream. Now he just wanted to spend his days in peace, like not getting food poisoned. Peter suddenly became disgusted, maybe because of the dislike of this situation, or perhaps at him getting swayed around doing nothing. Let's get back to work now. Peter said, returning to work to dispel the depression. Peter entered a multi-family house with Oliver and solved the rent issue of those who were behind in rent by taking away their life force. Next, he went to the underground office of a small private loan shark to solve the debts of the debtors by extracting the life force. While working around constantly like that, Oliver talked to Peter once again. Sir, can I ask you about something I'm curious about? Once again Peter didn't want to answer, but he was still afraid of Oliver, so Peter asked Oliver what he was curious about. But to Peter's surprise, a more shocking question came up than what he thought. Am I in danger? Peter's foot stopped in the dark back alley. What's that? Someone told me that I'll be in danger if I show too much talent. Is that right? Peter couldn't open his mouth. The reason was that he didn't know what to answer. Peter thought to himself whether he should answer the question, or should he say, he doesn't know or should he lie saying he's safe? When he thoughts of the usual Oliver, with his stupid appearance, he thought it would be okay if he lied, but he couldn't answer easily when he thought of a sharp Oliver who sometimes shows his face. What if he responds badly, and then takes out his anger on me? I don't think I can win. As he was thinking Oliver suddenly approached as if he had lost all his patience. Peter raised his hand in bewilderment to calm him down but Oliver did not care and grabbed Peter by the shoulder. Although there was not much strength in the grabbed hands, Peter could not resist because he had already lost his balance, and Peter, who was dragged backward like that, was stuck between a huge trash can and a protruding cement wall. Wait, hold on. Oliver opened the lid of the test tube without listening to Peter. The word death flashed in Peter's head. He couldn't believe that he was going to die without being able to do anything. At that time, Oliver extracted his emotions and chanted. 
double black shield. Two black shields spread out on the front and back. And soon gunshots rang out. Bang! Bang! The sound from the gun felt familiar. It was the sound of a shotgun, a sound that was often heard in the slums. It's also a modified shotgun, which is mainly used in gang protests. Is this an attack? Ah! Uh, Peter exclaimed embarrassingly. As soon as he answered, Oliver condensed the black shield in the back and shot at the attacker. Hate bullet! A crashing sound was heard. Peter poked out his face and saw the masked attacker. Although he could not see his face, he could see that he was confused. Peter shouted involuntarily. We have to catch him. Alive. The attacker began to flee hearing the words. As he was about to go into the alley, Oliver blocked his way and shot hate bullet. Bang. Quack. Oh, F asterisk CK. A bewildered swearing could be heard from behind the mask. Should I catch him alive? Yeah. Alive. Alive. Oliver mumbled as he extracted the emotions from the test tube and began to fiddle. However, the attacker did not stay still. He, who had no place to escape, pulled a scroll out of his arms. Peter knew instinctively what that action meant. The attacker is going to use the teleport scroll to get away. Damn it. It's late. Goodbye, ha! Huh? Just as the attacker was about to use the scroll something came rushing toward him and disabled him from moving. It was a black magic from Oliver, a black magic that Peter had never seen in his life. From its appearance, it looked like a spider web. It is a spider web that flies like a net and holds people tightly. Oh, this works? Oliver said as if it was nothing. Peter looked up at Oliver with surprise and asked. What's that? It's called Kling Web. Genius 15 incha. Kling Web? Finishing his words, Oliver approached the web-bound attacker. The attacker tied to the black spider web was hardened like a rock in the posture of spreading the scroll as if time seemed to have stopped and he couldn't even speak. His entire body was in a frozen state except for one, his eyes. Ah. Uh. The attacker looked at Oliver with eyes that were about to burst into tears. Oliver checked his condition once and turned off his attention as if he was not interested. Now. What should we do? Oliver looked back at Peter and asked. Peter still had a blank look on his face, with mixed feelings of fear, awe, and confusion. Then he opened his mouth with difficulty as if he had barely recovered his mind. We'll take him to master. Well, it might be good if he had fainted. While Peter was looking around, Oliver picked up a piece of brick that was scattered along the road and hit the attacker's head. The spider web, which bound the attacker, disappeared due to the external shock, but fortunately, the attacker fainted, so there was no problem. Looking down at the fallen attacker, Oliver said. I knocked him out. Ah. Now. How do we take him to master? It was a ridiculous question, but it wasn't a strange question either. The attacker is an adult male, well built, while Oliver is skinny. Hmm, shall we carry him together? Peter staggered up and said. Peter, who was relatively well built, lifted the attacker's upper body, while Oliver lifted his lower body, but soon, the two got exhausted and dropped the attacker to the floor. It's harder than I thought. By the way, can you answer me, now? Huh? What? The previous question. Am I in danger? Peter was silent once again. Even though he was just about to die, he was worried about Andrew and the faction below him. Peter thought about how funny his situation was. About five seconds later, Oliver opened his mouth once again. You don't have to answer if you don't want to. I'm sorry I asked you a question. Why did you help me earlier? When we were attacked. It was Oliver who was silent this time. Peter asked again while wondering why Oliver helped him. The warlock world is a place where the weak become the meat, 
while the strong eat the meat. The weaker a warlock is the quicker he gets abandoned. That was the reason why two junior disciples died during the last raid. Oliver answered. Why did you tell me about your life as a junior disciple and why did you answer when I asked this and that? So I helped you because you got something, don't you? Peter wondered at the answer that came with a question mark. However, the answer felt sincere. You asked if you were in danger, right? Yes. Yes, you were in danger. Peter answered without thinking. As you know, for a warlock, strength is rank and justice. In other words, if a strong warlock suddenly appears, no matter who he is, everyone must consider him as a superior. Because of that, the people who are already at the top keep the talented warlocks in check to the fullest extent, since he will be a threat to his place one day. Oliver listened silently. There was no expression or movement in the eyes. In that sense, you're better than anyone else. So you're on the lookout. Within ten days of coming in, you killed a junior disciple and took over his position. A person who was Andrew's man. Andrew's man? Faction. I mean, he's close to Andrew. Oliver tilted his head as if he didn't understand. Peter went into more detail. It's profitable to be close to each other. Andrew can consolidate his position, and the people at the bottom have someone to back them. It's been a long since this kind of structure solidified. Then, aren't there any other talented warlocks? No, didn't you listen to what I said? A brilliant warlock is not a welcome thing in the warlock community. But master. Master? What? Oliver tried to answer, but shook his head and said nothing since it felt strange. The reason was obvious, when he first met Joseph, he said his goal was to raise strong warlocks, but there was a strange gap between reality and what he said. Peter said again. So be careful. No one knows if the junior disciple who was in your place really died of food poisoning in the first place. That's all I can tell you. Peter stopped speaking as if he had repaid his favor. Along with that, he felt a strange satisfaction of doing something on his own with a sense of weakness that seemed to drain his energy. Oliver replied, looking at Peter. Thank you. Ha! Huh. Thank you for answering the question. It helped. Ah, uh, okay, that's a relief. Now shall we go back to work? Peter and Oliver once again lifted the attacker and started walking. The attacker was still heavy but Peter's heart felt light as he recalled Oliver thanking him. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. It's been a while. You wouldn't have come just to see my face, what's up? I came here to talk. In the basement of Joseph's Sausage Factory, there were many rooms like an ant cave, and two men talked in the most colorful reception room. One was Joseph, the owner of the place, and the other was Pharmacist, his dealer. No, not a mere dealer, Joseph's biggest dealer. He digests all of Joseph's products and supplies raw materials at the same time. So even Joseph, one of the best warlocks in the town, was careful with him. What, do you want a drink? No, thanks. We're busy, so I'd like to get straight to the point. I like it. What's the matter? The pharmacist bent his upper body slightly forward and opened his mouth carefully. The eyes over the gold-rimmed glasses shone sharply. Have you been attacked recently? During the collection of ingredients. How did you know? The pharmacist answered pulling his upper body. It's more of an assumption. The Anthony family, and the Dominic family, were all attacked. Oh, by the way, I'm also included. The truck that was going to Lando with products was attacked and robbed. Joseph's eyebrow went up. The pharmacist was a person who looked like a normal guy on the surface, but in reality, he was a scary person who wouldn't lose footing with Joseph or other warlocks in the city. The city's big man, who pretended to run a drugstore on the outside, while controlling all the transactions with warlocks from behind. 
it was safe to say that at least there was no one in this city who would go against him. But such a person's truck was robbed. Then, there was only one conclusion. Did the bugs crawl in from elsewhere? Probably. Landa is rapidly developing and the losers in the survival race are spreading around. Chances are high that the bug is one such kind. Ha ha ha. Joseph laughed. What is it? Regular gangs? Or warlocks? I don't know that. I'm just here to figure things out and explain the situation so that there won't be any misunderstanding between families. Joseph nodded. In the past, Pharmacist was the one who mediated between the warlock families that fought against each other to eat this small city and were on the verge of collapse. And since then, they have been strangely listening to the words of the pharmacist. Anyway, thank you for telling me, we'll search as soon as we can to find out who the culprit is. Can I ask you if we need any help? Yes, of course. It's our enemy anyway. If we find any trace, we'll contact you. As the conversation was coming to an end, they heard a knock on the door. Tock 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 tock. What? I'm talking to a customer right now, if it's not urgent, talk to me later. A panicked voice was heard through the door. Oh, I'm sorry master. But there's something I need to inform you about. Joseph spoke when the pharmacist winked at him as if he was fine. What? That? Oliver came. What? Oliver came with a guy who attacked them. Joseph and the pharmacist looked into each other's eyes without saying a word. Fast forward button 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 fast forward button. Oliver joined forces with Peter to drag the stun attacker. They couldn't carry him for a long time, so each grabbed one leg and dragged him, and thanks to this, the attacker's back was all split. Oliver and Peter, who were breathing hard and wiping their sweat, were resting for a while near the main gate, and before they knew it, informal disciples, junior disciples, and even intermediate and senior disciples started to gather. Wow, does it make sense? Did they really catch the attacker? They say so? But the moment when Joseph came out with the pharmacist, the disciples who stuck like flies around Oliver and Peter, scattered around. Did you catch the guy who attacked us? Ah, yes, master. Peter, who was tired from moving, answered. Then, the pharmacist who followed said with admiration. Oh my God, you really caught the attacker. I thought you must have made a mistake, but you really caught one. What a bunch of great disciples. Who caught him? Peter looked sideways at Oliver when asked by the pharmacist. The pharmacist, who understood the meaning, laughed loudly once again. Ha ha ha. Is it him again? I think I've seen that face. Your recent disciple, right? Yes, replied Joseph. You've brought some amazing kid. I knew he was exceptional when he took out life force but I didn't expect it to be this much. How old is he now? Thirteen or fourteen, right? And yet, he's like this. Everyone from the other family will be jealous if they heard it. Thank you for the compliment. Contrary to the answer, Joseph's expression was not very good. But the pharmacist didn't care about it and kept talking. This is the attacker, huh? Yes. We caught him while he was trying to run away with a scroll. What? Everyone, including Joseph, was surprised at the word scroll. Needless to say, scrolls are expensive items that wizards make. In particular, scrolls which can use tricky magic like teleport are very expensive. Proper items cost hundreds of thousands and hundreds of millions depending on safety and distance, even though dozens and hundreds of items were illegally made and sold on the black market. The pharmacist who was listening quietly intervened. Scroll, ha! Huh. Joseph, if you don't mind, can I take this attacker? Why? Isn't it suspicious to see him run away using an expensive scroll? I want to find the mastermind behind this attack as the person responsible for the peace of this community. Please allow me. 
I'll let you know everything in a week, and I'll give you anything in return. Joseph nodded after a moment of thought. The pharmacist has never lied before and in addition, the product production had been delayed due to the scuffle with the attacker. When the permission was given, the pharmacist smiled happily and ordered the bodyguard to take the fainted attacker to the car. Then he thanked Joseph once again and left the factory, but before he left, he greeted Oliver lightly. You did a great job, little friend. With the pharmacist gone, the factory became quiet, and Joseph opened his mouth and broke the silence. Oliver. Yes, master. How did you catch the attacker? Your seniors couldn't even catch their tail. Well, it's understandable if they're running away using scrolls. Sir. Peter helped me catch him, master. Joseph's eyebrow narrowed. Joseph felt something was terribly wrong, but there was no further questioning since he made a contribution. Okay, good, whatever it is it doesn't change the fact that you made a big contribution. No one denied it. If a disciple makes a contribution to the family, I have to give the disciple a reward. Thanks to you, I've got to relieve some stress. Well, let's see. It's unusual, but do you want me to make you an intermediate disciple? Everyone was surprised, including the intermediate disciples and the senior disciples. The number of disciples has always been fixed, but suddenly Joseph was trying to break it, just for one person. But no one was against it. In the first place, even the rules were set by Joseph, the owner of the family. If they objected to it, it might be considered a betrayal to the family. Thus everyone thought Oliver would become an intermediate disciple, but Oliver, the party concerned, expressed his refusal. I'm fine being a junior disciple, master. Everyone's eyes were on Oliver. Why? Oliver said with his peculiar blank look. Ah. Uh, I just want to be able to learn black magic. Thank you for making me a junior disciple. I just want you to teach me more often. Anne. What's wrong? There is a favor I'd really like to ask Master. I'd like to see how you make the product, so could you let me do some chores in the place where you make products? Are you asking me to put my junior disciples into production? Oh. Of course, I can do it myself. Joseph burst out laughing at Oliver's answer. Joseph thought for a while and opened his mouth slowly. Okay. There's no harm in increasing the number of workers anyway because the schedule is urgent. Ha! 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 Standing behind Joseph, the intermediate and senior disciples exclaimed in surprise. When Joseph turned around and asked what was wrong, they shut their mouths tightly. Joseph looked down at Oliver again. As you ask, I will increase the number of classes for the junior disciples and put them into production. Now, go and get some rest. Joseph went back, while Oliver bowed his head and said, Thank you, Master.